In a high-stakes geopolitical chess game, could the United States and Iran, both desperately trying to sidestep a catastrophic war, inadvertently spiral into one? This terrifying scenario looms as tensions escalate under the watchful eyes of President Joe Biden and Iran's supreme leader, Ayatollah Ali Khamenei. In a dramatic turn of events, early February saw the US unleash retaliatory strikes against Iranian-aligned militants. But Biden has clearly stated that his goal is merely deterrence, not war, even if Iran is supplying weapons and training to groups currently attacking American, Israeli, and Western targets in Yemen, Syria, and Lebanon. But here's the twist. Iran denies direct control, claiming these groups are rogue actors. This shadow play doesn't ease the growing tension, which feels like a ticking time bomb, ready to ignite a broader conflict. Biden himself has hinted at a dangerous precipice, where a multi-front war could erupt suddenly, trapping the US in a labyrinth with no clear exit. As the narrative unfolds, Iranian-supported militants have relentlessly targeted US troops mainly in Iraq. The burning question is, how deep does Iran's influence run within these militant groups? Are we witnessing a careful orchestration or a loose cannon scenario? And ultimately, how far are these two nations willing to go in this ominous game of brinksmanship and intrigue? The dispute between Iran and the US has intensified significantly since October 7, 2023, when, starting at approximately 6.30 a.m. local time, Hamas led a highly coordinated and brutal attack against the state of Israel. Along with a sizable contingent of Hamas fighters, the attacking force consisted of various other Palestinian militant groups, including the Palestinian Islamic Jihad, or PIJ. The assault began with a massive barrage of more than 2,200 rockets, most of which were launched into Israel in the first 20 minutes. This opening salvo reportedly overwhelmed Israel's sophisticated anti-missile defense system known as the Iron Dome. Ideally, this system would have intercepted and destroyed all short-range rockets or artillery shells fired from 4 to 70 kilometers away, but because of the sheer volume, a large number made it through. The attack took place on Shemini Atzeret, a Jewish holiday, presumably because large numbers of Israeli Defense Force soldiers would be on leave and the IDF would be primarily focused on Israel's northern border rather than on the Gaza Strip to the south. And as the rockets rained down on Israel, some 2,500 Hamas, PIJ and other fighters stormed through Israel's fortified border using explosives and bulldozers to clear their path. Once inside, they disabled several of the communication networks used to connect nearby Israeli military posts, allowing them to remain undetected for some time as they attacked those installations and murdered civilians at will. While this was happening, jihadist fighters using motorboats also breached Israeli's sea border near the coastal town of Zikim, while others entered Israel by air using motorized paragliders. On what would become the deadliest day for Jews since the Holocaust, around 1,400 people were killed, including IDF soldiers, families that were attacked in their homes, and attendees of an outdoor music festival. Most of the casualties were Israeli civilians, but a number of foreign nationals were also murdered in the attack. While an estimated 240 others were hauled back to the Gaza Strip as hostages. Among the hostages were a large number of Israelis with dual citizenship, collectively representing nearly two dozen other countries. In the wake of this attack, the Israeli government vowed to destroy Hamas and remove it from power, and within hours, the IDF would kick off an intensive air campaign against Hamas forces in Gaza, as Israeli troops marched into the Palestinian enclave in preparation for the major ground operation to come. Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu also pledged to do his best to minimize civilian casualties, but also warned all Palestinians living in the northern region of the Gaza Strip that they'd better evacuate immediately and head south. But as the war in Gaza has raged on, the violence of the conflict has continued to escalate right along with all the usual horrors of war, as well as the simmering tensions between several opposing nations. And this has left much of the international community asking, could the Israel-Gaza war spark a wider conflict, perhaps one involving the US and Iran? It's unsettling to think that escalation on this scale is possible, but given recent events, it's begun to seem increasingly possible, even inevitable. During the first few weeks of 2024 alone, a senior leader of Hamas, Salah al aruri the chair of Hamas's political bureau, was killed during a carefully orchestrated airstrike on a Hezbollah stronghold south of Beirut, Lebanon. Then, in retaliation, the Shia Islamist extremist group Hezbollah launched a rocket attack against an Israeli air surveillance base on Mount Meron. Then the US, also in the spirit of retaliation, used a drone strike to assassinate one of the Hezbollah Brigade's senior leaders in Iraq. 
while the Houthis, another Yemeni group of Iran-backed rebels, traded fire with the US Navy. And with every one of these strikes and counterstrikes, the likelihood that the war in Gaza will spill out across the region increased dramatically. As things stand, we're getting dangerously close to the end of a decades-old standoff, with the US and Israel on one side and Iran and its allied militant groups on the other. A few more wrong moves, and this violent chess match might erupt into a full-on war of nations that drags much of the Middle East region into chaos. With this sort of conflict, though, it's difficult to know what the tipping point will be. For example, the recent rocket attack against the base on Mount Meron came just one day after Hezbollah leader Syed Hassan Nasrallah said he must respond to the death of al arori even though Israel has yet to claim responsibility for the attack. As the commander in charge of Hamas operations in the West Bank and one of the founders of the military wing of Hamas, the Izzedine al qassam brigades, al arori wasn't a nobody. In fact, he was a crucial link in the chain connecting Hamas, Iran, and Hezbollah. After the civil war in Syria began, and Hamas chose to side not with the Bashar al-Assad regime but with the opposition, a rift emerged, with Hamas clearly on one side and Iran and Hezbollah firmly on the other. Over the last five years, however, al aruri has been deeply involved in re-establishing that alliance, even leading negotiations between Hamas, Iran, and Hezbollah leadership. This could certainly be why Nasrallah was so compelled to retaliate. In the short term, things might be difficult for Hamas, but as it's done in the past, when other leaders have been assassinated by Israel, the group will likely survive the death of al aruri But if nothing was done to avenge such a high-status player like Aruri, then all of Lebanon might become vulnerable to Israeli attack. As far as we know, there's still no evidence that Iran or Hezbollah played a direct role or even knew about the October 7th attack before it happened. But given Israel's swift, heavy-handed response, truly one of the most devastating military campaigns of the 21st century, Iran and its allies across the region have had no choice but to get involved. For if Iran were to leave Hamas to face Israel's retribution on their own, it would potentially risk undoing a military alliance that's been evolving since the 1979 Islamic Revolution. But by backing Hamas, indirectly at least, Iran appears to have put itself on a direct collision course with the West. And yet, to avoid dragging its benefactor into a full-scale war, Hezbollah especially will need to tread carefully. It can't simply tolerate US attacks, like the airstrike in Beirut that killed al aruri without looking weak or unreliable. But if their retaliatory actions end up sparking a war between, let's say, Israel and Lebanon, a country that's already facing a severe economic crisis, this might be too heavy a price to pay. Even if Hezbollah has carried out strikes along the Israeli border nearly every day since the conflict in Gaza started and Israel has routinely returned fire, each side appears to be carefully limiting the intensity of these clashes. The Biden administration seems to have taken a similarly cautious approach with Iran. For even as US forces target Iranian proxies in Iraq and Syria, they have not launched any attacks inside Iran. And even as Tehran uses its so-called axis of resistance, Hamas in Gaza, Hezbollah in Lebanon, the Houthis in Yemen, and Kataib Hezbollah in Iraq and Syria as its first line of defense against the US and Israel, it also appears to be taking measures to prevent the expansion of the war beyond the point of no return. Both in public and in private, Iran has praised Hezbollah's sacrifices, but at the same time cautioned that a war with Israel would be harmful to their larger ambitions in the region. But still, there's no denying that the Israel-Hamas conflict has already begun to escalate. The overall amount of death and destruction happening in Gaza vastly increased, mostly due to the indiscriminate use of increasingly powerful weapons. We've also seen this conflict spread as additional countries and militia groups, for one reason or another, get drawn into the carnage. Even before Israel's ground invasion of Gaza began at the end of October, the magnitude and scale of the firepower the IDF was using increased substantially. Recently, it's been estimated that some 70% of Gaza's homes and half of all other buildings have been damaged or destroyed, reaching a magnitude of devastation comparable to that of the Allied bombing of Dresden or Hamburg during World War II. Meanwhile, within the first 90 days of the conflict, more than 22,000 residents have been killed, and 85% of the population, nearly 2 million people, had been displaced. Inaccurate and contradictory evacuation orders coming from the IDF have also been a problem, these orders are also often transmitted via telecommunications networks that require electricity, two basic utilities that have been highly unreliable, if not absent altogether, in many areas of Gaza since the invasion. 
Many Gazans have also complained that under international law, those who choose not to evacuate still maintain their right to protection, meaning that if Israel, as the invading force, is telling people to leave, they must also ensure the safety, dignity, liberty and security of those being displaced. This should include, at a minimum, the continued maintenance of an adequate standard of living and regular access to humanitarian assistance. Israel's blockade, however, has made reliable access to humanitarian aid extremely difficult, leaving thousands if not millions of Palestinians living in appalling conditions. Even as far back as December 2023, the Secretary General of the United Nations warned that the humanitarian system in Gaza was nearing the point of total collapse. And recently the situation has only gotten worse, as hundreds of Israeli protesters, many of whom are family members of yet-to-be-released hostages, have attempted to block aid trucks from entering Gaza through the Kerem Shalom border crossing. After days of protests, delays and stoppages, as protesters continued to demand that no aid be allowed to enter Gaza via Israel until every hostage was set free, the IDF was forced to establish a closed military zone around the crossing, making it illegal for any civilians to be in the vicinity of the crossing or on nearby roads. The border region between Israel and Lebanon has also become a problem, as skirmishes between IDF and Hezbollah break out almost daily. This has prompted some 150,000 displaced locals to flee northern Israel and southern Lebanon, turning this region into a landscape of abandoned towns and neglected farms. Most of these Lebanese residents who've been displaced have received little to no help from the government, which is currently suffering a financial meltdown, the result of years of corruption and mismanagement, while the Israeli government, on the other hand, has reportedly been providing housing and food to many of its displaced citizens. Recently, the Biden administration has been trying to broker a deal between Israel, Lebanon and Hezbollah, but has so far been unsuccessful in reducing current tensions and moving Hezbollah forces away from the border. Hampering these and other negotiations could be the fact that the US will not negotiate directly with Hezbollah, which it has designated a terrorist organization, leaving the Lebanese Foreign Minister, Prime Minister and Speaker of Parliament to act as intermediaries in the negotiations. More than a decrease in the violence in northern Israel, though, what Biden would really like to see is the Lebanese armed forces becoming the sole border force on Lebanon's side of the border. This won't likely happen, though, until the war in Gaza comes to an end and Hezbollah is either annihilated along with Hamas or retreats deeper into Lebanon. Another Iranian-backed group that has continued to rally behind Hamas are the Houthis, a heavily armed Shia Muslim political religious faction coming out of Yemen. Alongside Hamas and Hezbollah, the Houthis have also declared themselves to be part of the Iranian-led Axis of Resistance, or the unofficial League of Extremist Groups who've aligned themselves against Israel, the US, and the West more generally. Having emerged in the 1990s, the Houthis were originally known as the Ansar Allah, or Partisans of God, but they've since adopted the name of the movement's late founder, Hussein al-Houthi. And since the early 2000s, under the leadership of the founder's brother, Abdul Malik al-Houthi, the Houthis have been fighting a series of rebellions against Yemen's longtime authoritarian president, Ali Abdullah Saleh, in an attempt to gain sovereignty over their homeland in the north of the country. At the moment, the Houthis control Sana'a and the northwest of Yemen, including the Red Sea coastline, a large area where most of Yemen's population lives, where they run a de facto government which collects taxes and prints its own money. In solidarity with Hamas, at the start of the Gaza invasion, the Houthis began attacking Israel with missiles and drone strikes, but the majority of these have been intercepted. Where the Houthis have really been making an impact is out on the Red Sea, as they've increasingly targeted ships which are Israeli-owned, flagged or operated, or heading to Israeli ports. Most of the vessels they've attacked, however, have had no connection with Israel and this has prompted a number of major shipping companies to cease their operations in the Red Sea, opting for a much longer and safer route around the southern tip of Africa. But after more than two dozen attacks, the US and 11 other nations decided to assemble an international maritime coalition, with the primary goal of maintaining freedom of navigation in the Red Sea. Given that some 30% of global container trade passes through the Suez Canal, the Houthis have caused some huge disruptions to industry and related supply chains, and the coalition has had enough. In a stern warning to Houthis, the coalition demanded they cease their attacks immediately and release any detained vessels or crews, or else. The Houthis, however, seem undeterred as they continue to threaten lives on the Red Sea and, in turn, face the consequences. 
Despite US Navy ships and jets shooting down a number of Houthi drones and missiles, some current and former US defense officials have argued that this won't be enough to deter the increasingly bold, almost daily attacks occurring in the Red Sea. And when this turned out to be correct, staying true to their word, the US and UK launched a series of strikes against Houthi targets in Yemen. Some of the most recent strikes have employed US F-A-18 fighter jets launched from the USS Dwight D. Eisenhower, along with a hail of Tomahawk missiles sent from two Navy destroyers, the USS Gravely and the USS Kearney. The US also recently hit targets associated with other Iranian-backed militias and the Iranian Revolutionary Guard in Iraq and Syria, reportedly in retaliation to the drone strike on the logistic support base at Tower 22 of the Jordanian Defense Network that killed three US service members the week before. On top of that, sometime in early February, the US carried out a cyber attack against an Iranian military ship suspected of collecting intelligence on cargo vessels in the Red Sea and the Gulf of Aden. The details of the operation remain classified, but overall, the objective was to inhibit the ship's ability to share intelligence with Houthi rebels in the area. After the attack, Iran's UN ambassador, Amir Saeed Erevani, claimed that the vessel in question was in the Red Sea to combat pirate activities and was not providing intelligence to Houthi forces. But even if Iran maintains their support of the Houthis is solely political, the US has continued to accuse Tehran of enabling them to terrorize civilian operations in the Red Sea. Take, for example, the recent analysis conducted by the US Defense Intelligence Agency that confirmed Houthi forces had been using Iranian-made missiles and UAVs in their attacks. As far back as 2014, the analysis revealed, Iran's Quds Force, a branch of its Islamic Revolutionary Guard Corps that specializes in unconventional warfare and military intelligence, has provided the Houthis with a growing arsenal of sophisticated weapons as well as training. With all the havoc being created by the so-called three H's, Hamas, Hezbollah, and the Houthis, it's hard to say exactly how close we really are to seeing a full-scale war breakout between some combination of the US, Iran, Lebanon, and Israel. If Iran were to directly attack Israel or some American asset, let's say in retaliation to the US Navy's continued attacks on the Houthis, would that be the spark that ignites the next major conflict in the Middle East? The isolated attacks and skirmishes we've seen so far haven't been enough to warrant direct military action from Iran. Even if they don't approve of Israel's invasion into Gaza, it seems Iran's leaders would rather avoid a war, a war that would very likely involve the US. And so far, Iran's leaders have taken a more pragmatic approach. Their primary concern seems to be the preservation and progress of their country, and a war with the US and Israel is not one they would likely win. Something that could also escalate things, spreading the Israel-Hamas conflict beyond its current borders, would be if Israel gets fed up with Hezbollah and decides to attack Iran directly. The IDF has been managing the Hezbollah threat pretty well so far, but if Iran continues to support the group with cash, weapons and training, Israel may have no choice but to officially pull Tehran into the fray. There's also the possibility that other Arab countries, such as Bahrain, Saudi Arabia, or the United Arab Emirates, will take up arms against Israel, but this is less likely. For even if Israel's current campaign in Gaza has outraged much of the Arab world, there's nothing that indicates right now that any major Arab country will intervene on behalf of the besieged Gazans. It should be noted as well that few Arab states, especially Egypt, have little sympathy for Hamas. Despite their current disapproval of Israel, most countries, including Iran, will likely remain hesitant to get directly involved, at least as long as the US maintains its current presence in the region. Back in early October 2023, the US deployed two aircraft carrier strike groups to the eastern Mediterranean Sea. These warships were never intended to join the fighting in Gaza or take part in Israel's operations, but the deployment of two of the most powerful vessels in the Navy's fleet did come with a clear message to Iran and its proxies. Stay out of it. The first carrier to arrive was the USS Gerald R. Ford, followed by the USS Dwight D. Eisenhower. Ideally, this show of force would deter hostile action against Israel, limiting the scale of the war. For now, the Eisenhower and its contingent of some 60 aircraft, as well as a guided missile cruiser and two guided missile destroyers, will remain in the region. The Ford, on the other hand, recently returned to its home port in Norfolk, Virginia. But even without its newest and most advanced aircraft carrier, the US 6th Fleet will continue to maintain a commanding presence in the eastern Mediterranean. This includes guided missile destroyers, which have been responsible for bringing down a number of Houthi drones and missiles, as well as the USS Bataan, an amphibious assault ship carrying Marine Corps F-35 stealth fighters and other members of the Bataan Amphibious Ready Group, 
including the USS Carter Hall and USS Mesa Verde. Don't be fooled by this grand display of force, however, because even if the US rushed to the aid of Israel immediately following Hamas's attack, the last thing the US wants after two decades of costly fighting in Iraq and Afghanistan is another war in the Middle East. If Washington isn't careful, though, that's exactly what it's going to get. If their recent actions in Baghdad and Beirut haven't been antagonistic enough, the US has also been criticized for its ongoing supply of military aid to Israel, despite increased reports of civilian casualties. In fact, the civilian-led human rights organization Amnesty International has even alleged that fragments of a Joint Direct Attack Munitions Guidance System, or JDAM, were found at the scene of an October 2023 bombing where 43 civilians were killed. It's common knowledge that Israel uses a wide variety of weapons and munitions provided by the US, but this was one of the first times an American-made weapon was tied to a specific attack. According to the organization, this event had to be either a direct attack on civilians or an indiscriminate attack and should therefore be investigated as a potential war crime. In response, an IDF representative adamantly disputed this report, insisting the claims being made by Amnesty International were biased, baseless, and premature. Pentagon spokesperson Air Force Major General Patrick Ryder added that the US would continue to consult closely with its Israeli partners on the importance of minimizing civilian casualties. Still, there have been those, primarily former President Donald Trump and his supporters, that have criticized President Biden for being too soft on Iran, especially concerning his response to the drone attack that killed three soldiers in Jordan. In hindsight, both camps have resorted to blaming the other. Trump ordered the assassination of Iranian Major General Qasem Soleimani, but Biden lifted the sanctions on Tehran. But Trump chose to withdraw from the 2015 nuclear deal, but now Biden isn't responding forcefully enough to Iran-backed attacks on US troops. Depending on who in Washington you ask, each one of these actions or inactions has either emboldened Iran or kept the US from starting a war. There have been top national security officials who served under Trump as well as congressional Republicans who have accused Biden of failing to prevent these recent attacks, arguing that the drone strike in Jordan wouldn't have happened if Trump were president. But officials in Biden's corner were quick to shoot back, pointing out that deadly attacks linked to Iran did happen on Trump's watch. But perhaps Biden has simply been more concerned with helping his friends than attacking his enemies. As one of the first countries to recognize the State of Israel's Declaration of Independence back in 1948, the US has remained one of Israel's closest allies ever since. Driven by shared democratic values, strategic interests, and cultural ties, over the years this relationship has evolved and strengthened as the US has continued to provide military, economic, and diplomatic support. Even through various changes in leadership, shifts in regional dynamics, and disagreements over specific policies, this relationship has survived, and overall, the alliance between the two remains strong. So why would anyone expect the US to stand back now? As Hamas continues to openly oppose Palestinian recognition of the State of Israel as it wages its campaign of terror in an attempt to derail a peaceful future for not just these two nations, but the broader Arab region. What began smoldering in the mid-20th century has continued to burn for decades, becoming one of the world's longest-running disputes between two nations. But it wasn't until 2007, after Hamas emerged as the de facto authority in the Gaza Strip and Israel and Egypt established a blockade around the area, that the stage would be set for a decade and a half of back-and-forth outbursts of violence. Ever since the first major conflict erupted between Israel and Hamas in 2008, the Gaza Strip has experienced ongoing destruction and horrendous civilian casualties. Over the years, periodic ceasefire agreements have temporarily eased tensions, prompting Israel to lift its blockade and allow for much-needed foreign aid to make its way into the Gaza Strip. Also, as the years have passed, some Israeli officials began to believe that Hamas was slowly starting to relent, and even if there continue to be occasional flare-ups of violence, this could be manageable in the long term. But on October 7th, that all changed, and the error of this assumption became tragically clear. While Iran had been strengthening its influence and forming alliances with other entities in the region, the Israeli leadership had become distracted by ongoing violence in the West Bank, political turmoil at home, and simmering tensions with Hezbollah in Lebanon, leaving Israel drastically unprepared for the attack to come. But this still leaves the question, why now? Many experts believe Hamas's sudden escalation of violence was intended to derail the potential peace agreement that was being brokered by the US between Saudi Arabia and Israel. 
As part of this agreement, Saudi Arabia intended to address Palestine's concerns in general, but the Palestinians were not directly involved in the discussions, and this did not sit well with Hamas, and we all know what happened after that. Less than two hours after the attack began, the IDF announced a state of alert, letting the Israeli public know that war was imminent. Soon, Israel began mobilizing its reserve army units, calling up more than 350,000 troops over the next few days. Another two hours later, IDF fighter jets began pounding the Gaza Strip with airstrikes. Then, on October 8, Israel officially declared itself to be at war with Hamas, prompting Prime Minister Netanyahu to warn Gazan residents that they'd better get out as soon as possible, for Israeli troops would be coming soon, and they'd be coming with all their might. Another day later, Israel began a full-on siege of the Gaza Strip, cutting off much of the region's supply of water, electricity, food, and fuel. In the midst of the crisis, an ongoing international effort is being made to secure the release of the hostages and hopefully end the conflict, but even that might not be enough for Israel, as it seems wholly determined to root out and destroy every last member of Hamas. Adding to the difficulty of locating the hostages, as well as targeting Hamas militants and weapons caches, is Gaza's subterranean tunnel system, an intricate web of passageways extending for hundreds of kilometers. These tunnels are used by Hamas as well as other Gazans to get around the blockade, conduct operations, and hide from Israeli forces. Fighting throughout these tunnels, however, is not easy and creates a deadly situation for all those inside, especially IDF troops and the hostages who might be held there but destroying them without civilian casualties has also proved to be difficult. Gaza's highly dense population also presents a unique challenge for IDF troops on the ground. The official second phase of the war began on October 27th and included a comprehensive ground invasion into the northern Gaza Strip, an area that was supposed to have been previously evacuated. The IDF planned to split the Gaza Strip, compelling Palestinian civilians to move southwards while targeting isolated Hamas units in the north. Electronic communication in most of Gaza was initially suspended, with the intention of restricting Hamas's ability to organize their defense. But this also seriously limited the ability of medical and humanitarian organizations to respond to emergencies. On October 27, the Rafah border crossing between the Gaza Strip and Egypt was opened, under conditions agreed to by Egypt, Hamas, and Israel, allowing a limited number of foreign nationals to leave Gaza for the first time since the war broke out. Three weeks later, on November 22nd, the Israeli government agreed to a prisoner exchange with Hamas, mediated by Qatar and Egypt, that would include a temporary ceasefire. This lasted seven days, and in exchange for 240 Palestinian prisoners, 110 of the hostages were freed. But when the fighting ultimately resumed, Israeli forces moved into Khan Yunis, the largest urban center in the south of the Gaza Strip and the suspected location of many of Hamas's senior leaders. Up until March 2024, a staggering 1.9 million Palestinians, more than 80% of the population, have been internally displaced, and as the number of casualties has continued to climb, this has evolved into the deadliest conflict for Palestinians since the 1948 Arab-Israeli War. But the mounting number of civilian casualties and extensive destruction in Gaza has not come without scores of fiery criticisms. Even President Biden has noted that Israel is beginning to lose international support. By early January 2024, over 22,000 Palestinians had been reported dead, prompting Israel to announce a change in strategy that would result in a more targeted approach. And by the end of January, the number of average daily deaths dropped to one-third of what it was back in October. But still, as Israel expands its invasion into the southern Gaza Strip, millions of Palestinian civilians have been left with nowhere to go, caught between the Israeli army, the sealed Egyptian border, and the Mediterranean Sea. There's been rampant speculation about what Israel's ultimate intentions are for the trapped Palestinians. One option that Israel has apparently considered is to move the nearly 2 million displaced Palestinians across the border into Egypt's Sinai Desert first into tent encampments before eventually building permanent cities. This idea was first proposed in what Prime Minister Netanyahu's office called a concept paper, drafted by Israel's intelligence ministry, a junior ministry that conducts research but does not set policy shortly after the start of the war. When this report was first leaked, Palestinians across the board immediately condemned the idea claiming that it echoed their people's greatest tragedy, the displacement of hundreds of thousands of them following Israel's independence back in 1948. 
The report wasn't viewed favorably by Cairo either, but took it as evidence that Israel might try to shift the burden of Gaza onto Egypt. Even though Egypt ruled over Gaza between 1948 and 67, when Israel first captured the territory, along with the West Bank and East Jerusalem, the vast majority of Gaza's current population are the descendants of Palestinian refugees uprooted from what is now Israel. Critics of the Sinai Desert idea also pointed out that Egypt might not necessarily be the refugees' last stop, given that the report also mentions Turkey, Qatar, Saudi Arabia, and the United Arab Emirates as being potential supporters of the plan, either financially or by taking in Gazan refugees as long-term residents. Canada was also identified as a potential area for resettlement given its lenient immigration practices. The report also introduces but at the same time dismisses two other options, one reinstating the West Bank-based Palestinian Authority, or two actively supporting a new local regime. The report did not outline what would become of Gaza once its population is completely cleared out, but its authors seem to believe that this was the best outcome in terms of Israel's long-term security. Facing heavy criticism, the Prime Minister's office was quick to downplay the report as a hypothetical exercise, pointing out that right now they are primarily focused on destroying the governing and military capabilities of Hamas, a goal that many doubt is even possible given the group's deep roots in Palestinian society. Right now, the humanitarian situation in Gaza is in freefall, as Israeli attacks have continued across the Gaza Strip with little let-up and the death toll in the enclave continues to climb. And as this violent conflict expands beyond the borders of Palestine, we can't help but ask, when and how is this going to end? There are hard questions to answer, but what's become increasingly clear is that as long as Israel keeps up its offensive in Gaza, regional tensions are likely to remain high, and while the US continues to provide crucial military and diplomatic support to Israel, it's hard to say what will provoke Biden to actually intervene at the moment, even Iran appears to be under the impression that the US would prefer to stay on the sidelines of this war, not to mention avoid entering one with them. But despite Iran's desire for the same, if it keeps on supporting Hamas and allowing Hezbollah and the Houthis to attack US bases and terrorize international shipping, a war with the US might be exactly what they get. But what do you think? How much more of this back and forth will the US put up with? Are Iran and the US on an unavoidable collision course? Could a wider conflict break out involving Iran, Israel, Lebanon and the US? What would that look like? Be sure to let us know in the comments. And don't forget to hit that subscribe button. Imagine a highly advanced missile defense system, able to engage multiple threats simultaneously, intercepting and destroying them in midair before they can reach their intended targets. Sounds unbelievable, right? Well, it's real, and it's one of Israel's biggest assets against Hamas's relentless attacks. If you've turned on the news recently, you've probably heard mention of Israel's so-called Iron Dome. In the complex environment of modern warfare, where the threat of artillery and missiles perpetually looms over nations, the Iron Dome system has received huge amounts of attention and controversy since its inception in 2011. Known globally for its technological and strategic efficacy, the anti-missile system has helped reshape the paradigms of military defense, providing a three-dimensional shield against short-range rockets and artillery shells. Developed jointly by Rafael Advanced Defense Systems and Israel Aerospace Industries, the Iron Dome utilizes a combination of sophisticated radar technology, advanced data processing, and precise missile interception mechanisms, which work together to stop missiles headed into Israel. Yet, this technology is also far from infallible, and concerns over its continued effectiveness, ethical implications, and ability to deal with massive and sophisticated attacks are all too real. Today, let's take a look at how the Iron Dome actually works, its performance, and just how well it might fare in future conflicts. To begin with, it's helpful to understand a bit of the Iron Dome's history and context. Development of the Iron Dome began as early as 2005, Brigadier General Danny Gold, then head of Mafat, Israel's Directorate of Military Research, decided to start the program for a next-generation missile interceptor. By 2007, Israel commissioned the development of Iron Dome, choosing Israeli contractor Rafael over the American giant Lockheed Martin. Another Israeli company, Empressed Systems, was put in charge of programming the core of Iron Dome's battle management system. Iron Dome went from the drawing board to combat readiness within less than four years. 
a remarkably short period of time for a weapon system designed from scratch and far less than had been spent on any other missile interceptor system around the world. By mid-2009, the system successfully intercepted a number of rockets mimicking Kassam and short-range Katyusha rockets in a Defense Ministry test. Testing would continue for another two years before the Iron Dome was declared operational by the IDF, and Defense Minister Ehud Barak authorized deployment of the system in March 2011. In November 2012, during Operation Pillar of Defense, the Iron Dome had its first major trial by fire. Mitigating the impacts of rockets launched from Gaza into Israel, the system displayed an impressive interception rate of approximately 85%, according to Israeli Defense Forces, providing tangible protective value and giving the Iron Dome its first instance of international visibility. This operation spotlighted the Iron Dome's ability to discern between threats headed towards populated areas and those bound for open fields, a crucial capability for minimizing resource usage and avoiding unnecessary interceptions. 2014 witnessed another significant chapter in the Iron Dome's operational history during the so-called Operation Protective Edge. This 50-day conflict saw the system intercepting rockets at an unprecedented rate, as 4,594 rockets and mortars were fired at Israeli targets. Iron Dome systems intercepted 735 projectiles that it determined were threatening, achieving an intercept success rate of 90%. Only 70 rockets fired at Israel from Gaza failed to be intercepted, leading many to believe that the Iron Dome had effectively neutralized the threat of rockets. Further evolution was noted by military analysts in May 2021. During the Israel-Gaza crisis of that month, the Iron Dome was subjected to an intense barrage of rockets, encountering a scale and complexity of fire not previously seen. In the first 24 hours of conflict, 470 rockets were fired from Gaza a much higher rate than had been attained in any previous conflicts. Of the rockets, 17% were also long-range attacks on Tel Aviv, demonstrating an elevated interception rate of nearly 90%. The system safeguarded urban locales and strategically important sites, all while underlining Israelis' technical prowess in missile defense. There had long been concern among Israeli officials that the system would struggle to deal with a truly massive barrage of rockets a fear which has played out vividly in recent weeks. However, even so, the Iron Dome continues to represent the world's most successful and technologically advanced missile interceptor, far outperforming other similar systems. One reason for this is the Iron Dome's dispersal. Typical air defense missile batteries consist of a radar unit, missile control unit, and several launchers, which are generally all located at the same site. On the other hand, the Iron Dome is built to deploy in a scattered pattern. Each launcher, containing 20 interceptors, is independently deployed and operated remotely via a secure wireless connection. Reportedly, each Iron Dome battery is capable of protecting an urban area of approximately 58 square miles. So how exactly does the Iron Dome function? To answer this question, let's dive into the three main components of the system. The Detection and Tracking Radar, the Battle Management and Control BMC system, and the Missile Firing Unit. First is the Iron Dome's Detection and Tracking Radar, developed by ELTA, a subsidiary of Israel Aerospace Industries, which serves as a vigilant sentinel in the defense system. Its primary function is to continuously survey the skies, hunting for potential airborne threats like rockets, artillery, mortars, and other objects that might pose a threat to populated areas. Once a threat is detected, the radar system begins to meticulously track its trajectory, speed, and altitude. When an enemy rocket is launched, the radar system immediately detects its presence by sending out radio waves that bounce back upon hitting an object. This reflection allows the radar to determine not only the object's location, but also calculates its speed and direction by analyzing the change in the return signal's frequency, a phenomenon known as the Doppler effect. This precise tracking is paramount because, in the context of airborne threats, even minor miscalculations can result in failure to intercept, potentially leading to devastating consequences. The detection and tracking radar then promptly relays this information. The data is transmitted in real time, ensuring the immediate flow of critical information to enable swift decision-making. The radar can manage multiple threats simultaneously, tracking numerous incoming objects and providing data on each to ensure a comprehensive defensive response. 
This capability is vital in scenarios where adversaries launch multiple projectiles in quick succession, intending to overwhelm defense systems. Notably, the radar system incorporates Electronic Counter Countermeasures ECCM, which are designed to ensure it operates effectively even under electronic attacks, such as jamming. This robustness against electronic warfare attempts enhances its reliability, ensuring it can function even in contested electronic environments. Precision, speed, and reliability are pivotal attributes of the Iron Dome's radar system, which are vitally crucial given the short flight times of rockets fired from close ranges. This radar has to function with impeccable accuracy and speed to allow the Iron Dome system enough time to assess the threat and, if necessary, launch an interceptor missile to neutralize it before it reaches its target. The second critical element of the Iron Dome is its Battle Management and Control BMC, system. This is the strategic and computational brain behind the Iron Dome. In the split-second intricacies of modern warfare, where projectiles travel at immense speeds, the BMC has the monumental task of processing the enormous amount of data from the detection and tracking radar, making vital decisions and orchestrating an effective defensive response in a matter of moments. Upon receiving the critical data from the radar system, the BMC springs into a whirlwind of activity. It takes the information about the detected object, its speed, trajectory, and anticipated point of impact, and instantaneously runs it through a sophisticated algorithm. The object here is to ascertain whether the incoming projectile poses a legitimate threat to civilian areas or critical infrastructure. It's a mathematical prophecy of where the missile or rocket will land, based on its current path and other kinetic variables. If a projectile is deemed to be heading towards an uninhabited area where it will cause no harm, the BMC might choose to let it proceed unhindered, conserving resources. However, if a threat is headed toward a populated or strategic area, the BMC switches from analysis to action, deciding in a split second to intercept the incoming projectile. This capability to discriminate between threats, thereby selectively engaging only those that pose a genuine risk, is pivotal in minimizing costs and avoiding unnecessary interceptor launches. Subsequently, the BMC system communicates with the missile firing unit, providing it with data required to launch an interceptor missile with a high probability of successfully neutralizing the threat. The path of the interceptor is dynamically adjusted by the BMC, utilizing continuous data feeds about its position and the position of the incoming projectile to facilitate a successful interception. This dynamic mid-course guidance and the fine-tuning of the trajectory are crucial in ensuring that the interceptor and threat collide, even when the threat is maneuvering. Moreover, the BMC operates in unison with multiple launchers and can manage numerous threats simultaneously orchestrating a coordinated response to multiple incoming projectiles. This is essential in scenarios of massive rocket salvos, where multiple threats in the sky need to be systematically and concurrently neutralized to protect assets on the ground. All these operations, threat analysis, decision-making, and interceptor guidance occur within an incredibly compact timeframe, exemplifying a mesmerizing fusion of advanced technology, mathematics, and strategic defense thinking. The BMC thus stands as the nerve center of the Iron Dome, effectively steering its operations. The final piece of the Iron Dome is its missile firing unit. This is essentially the muscle behind the operation, springing into action once a threat has been identified and a decision has been made to intercept. Imagine if you could launch a super-fast, highly accurate baseball to intercept and neutralize a dangerous object flying through the air. That's akin to what the missile firing unit does, but with cutting-edge technology and precise calculations. This component of the Iron Dome houses the interceptor missiles, which are designed to collide with incoming threats and neutralize them before they can reach their intended target. The actual missile used by the Iron Dome, called the Tamir Interceptor, is built to be highly maneuverable and incredibly fast, ensuring that it can meet threats head-on, even when they are moving at high speeds. Once the battle management and control system decides that a threat must be intercepted, the missile firing unit gets to work. The BMC communicates the precise data regarding the incoming projectile's path, speed, and anticipated location of impact to the missile firing unit. Armed with this information, the unit launches an interceptor missile into the sky, aimed to meet the incoming threat at a calculated collision point. The act of launching is merely the beginning of the journey for the interceptor. 
After being propelled into the sky, it needs to find and collide with the threat. This is where guidance from the BMC continues to play a vital role. The interceptor is consistently guided by the BMC, which adjusts its path in real time to ensure it remains on a collision course with the incoming projectile. The Tamir interceptor is designed to destroy the incoming threat by detonating its warhead nearby, neutralizing the threat in the sky, and ensuring debris falls in areas where it's less likely to cause harm. This ability to intercept projectiles mid-air is a complex ballet of precision, speed, and technology meant to destroy projectiles efficiently while minimizing the risk to civilian life and infrastructure on the ground. When dealing with salvos of multiple projectiles, the missile firing unit is capable of launching numerous interceptors in quick succession, maintaining a formidable defense against a barrage of incoming threats. The unit works in concert with the other components of the Iron Dome, ensuring that the identified threats are engaged and neutralized effectively. In simple terms, the missile firing unit is the component of the Iron Dome that takes immediate, tangible action against identified airborne threats, launching, guiding, and detonating interceptor missiles to protect the skies and shield the population and infrastructure below from harm. This vital piece of the defense puzzle ensures that theory and strategy are transformed into definitive, protective action. These three components work together seamlessly, creating a protective dome in the sky. The radar spots the threat, the BMC decides on the action, and the missile firing unit responds, all in a matter of minutes. It's a finely tuned symphony of technology where each part plays a crucial role and must perform flawlessly to ensure the safety of the population below. When you integrate these three components, the Vigilant Radar, the Intelligent BMC, and the Defensive Missile Firing Unit, you get a system that is far more than the sum of its parts. Yet even with these incredibly advanced interception capabilities, one of the Iron Dome's main weaknesses is sheer volume. The system can potentially be overcome by huge volleys of missiles that exceed its capability to intercept them. Also, the cost of each interception is high, while attacking rockets can be relatively inexpensive. These are among the reasons encouraging the development of the Iron Beam energy weapon to complement the Iron Dome, which is cheap to fire, has unlimited ammunition, and is effective at short range. Iron Dome is also significantly less effective against very short-distance saturation strikes. Hamas is well aware of these vulnerabilities. In addition to having enormous numbers of rockets and using saturation strikes, the group consistently fires rockets at low trajectories to make them harder to intercept. According to Israeli journalist Ronan Bergman, in 2012 during Operation Pillar of Defense, Israel agreed to an early ceasefire. For a reason that has remained a closely guarded secret, the Iron Dome anti-missile defense system had run out of ammunition. Bergman says that as a result of the experience, Israel had tried to prepare larger stocks of interceptors for future rounds of fighting. The most recent conflict between Israel and Hamas has highlighted that a volume of projectiles to intercept is still a weakness, as the Iron Dome has been hard-pressed to stop every incoming missile. Over the first few years of the Iron Dome's deployment, the maximum number of rockets fired at Israel per day, even during periods of open conflict, ranged from roughly 200 to 300. During the May 2021 fighting, that increased substantially, with 470 rockets fired over the first 24 hours. But in 2023, somewhere between 2,200 and upwards of 3,500 rockets were launched in just the first 20 minutes. This reality made clear that despite being far superior to any other missile defense system, the Iron Dome is not impenetrable. As Patrick Sullivan and John Amble of the West Point Modern War Institute noted in a recent analysis, that quantity was simply too much for Iron Dome to manage. Hamas rocket fire is notoriously imprecise, and Iron Dome is designed not to expend ammunition on incoming rounds whose trajectories do not indicate an impact in a populated area. That is an important advantage weighing in Iron Dome's favor. If Hamas fires 10 rockets and misses with 9, Iron Dome can most likely intercept the one threatening round. If Hamas fires 100 and misses with 90, that poses more of a challenge. But given the system's demonstrated success rate, most and likely all of the threat can be thwarted. But extrapolate this dynamic by firing a thousand, two thousand, or even more rockets, and eventually the advantage shifts in favor of the attacker. This is a stark reminder that no defense, however sophisticated, is truly impenetrable. 
Yet even with this weakness, there is also no doubt that the Iron Dome remains head and shoulders above any other country's missile defense systems. The system's effectiveness, however, does not lie solely in its technological sophistication, but in its capacity to integrate seamlessly into Israel's wider security and defense strategy, aligning technological capabilities with strategic objectives. So as geopolitical dynamics evolve and new challenges emerge, the Iron Dome will almost certainly continue to adapt. But even with its weaknesses, the Iron Dome represents a remarkable achievement of military technology. The interplay of its principal components, the detection and tracking radar, the battle management and control system, and the missile firing unit orchestrates a rapid, usually precise response to incoming missiles. Each component plays a pivotal role, from initial detection and threat assessment to the actual interception. The evolution and deployment of the Iron Dome underscore Israel's broader strategic imperative to safeguard the lives of its citizens. For more than a decade, it has also given Israel the psychological and logistical upper hand in its clashes with Hamas. While the most recent conflict has put this into question for some, there is little doubt that the Iron Dome has altered the paradigm of modern military defense strategies, contributing to the doctrine of using technological might to proactively defend against short-range missiles. But what do you think? In the rapidly evolving world of geopolitics, how much of a role will the Iron Dome and similar systems play in the years to come? Let us know your thoughts in the comments below and don't forget to subscribe for more military content and analysis. On February 3, 2024, the US Central Command CENTCOM, released a statement detailing joint strikes conducted by the US and UK, targeting the Houthi rebels in Yemen. The statement briefly answers three questions – when, where, and why. When, on February 3rd, around 11.30 p.m. Sana time, which is 2.30 p.m. Central Standard Time. Where, at 13 locations within the terrorist-controlled area of Yemen. And why, to respond to increased destabilizing and illegal activities in the region. However, CENTCOM's statement didn't mention anything about the how, so let us fill you in. For these airstrikes, the US deployed the Navy's most advanced carrier-based multi-role strike fighters available today, the FA-18EF Super Hornets. This fact raises another why question. Why were Super Hornets used to devastate the Houthis? Though, let's be honest, if you aren't familiar with the Red Sea Crisis, the answer to the first why question, why were the Houthis targeted, won't mean much to you. So let's give you proper answers to any questions you might have about this situation. Let's start with what exactly happened on February 3rd. As mentioned, multilateral coalition strikes were launched against the Houthis, who had been redesignated as terrorists by the US Department of State on January 17th. These strikes were primarily conducted by CENTCOM forces and the British Armed Forces, with support from Australia, Bahrain, Canada, Denmark, the Netherlands, and New Zealand. The strikes hit 36 targets across 13 locations in Houthi-controlled Yemen, including underground storage facilities, command and control centers, unmanned aerial vehicle UAV storage and operation sites, missile systems, radar installations, and helicopters. But why these targets? Because they were used, either directly or indirectly, to attack international merchant vessels, the Royal Navy and the US Navy ships in the Red Sea, Bab el-Mandeb Strait, and the Gulf of Aden. Based on the targets involved in these strikes, it's easy to conclude that the US and UK intended to degrade Houthi capabilities to continue their unlawful attacks on vessels in the region. If you're well-versed in US military equipment, the list of targets will also tell you why the Super Hornets were used. If not, don't worry, we're about to break it down for you. When it comes to the equipment used for the strikes, one location is of particular importance – the underground storage facilities. The February 3rd statement by CENTCOM is the first time these facilities were included in the target list. The nature of these locations likely has something to do with the choice of fighter jets used to strike them. You see, the Super Hornets can release GBU-24 Paveway 3 bombs that offer unique functionality. Namely, these 2,000-pound laser-guided bombs can penetrate hardened structures before exploding, making them ideal for striking underground facilities like bunkers and command centers. The GBU-24 bombs are precise enough to fly down ventilation shafts into hardened targets, but they do need to be controlled by the aircrew until impact. This makes them different from the Joint Direct Attack Munition JDAM, weapons deployed in the region, as these use GPS-guided bombs. 
Besides the underground facilities, another target on the list was taken out by the Super Hornets, the Houthi radar installations. However, this time, the US used a specialized variant of the two-seated Super Hornets, the EA-18G Growler. The Growler is a carrier-based electronic warfare aircraft that can carry extensive radar jamming equipment as well as the AGM-88 HARMS. To understand the purpose of these missiles, all you need to know is what HARMS stands for, which is High Speed Anti-Radiation Missile. In other words, AGM-88 HARMS home in on surface-to-air radar systems and neutralize them. These two uses alone should tell you how versatile the Super Hornets are. They also warrant a closer look at the Boeing FA-18EF Super Hornet weapon series. The Super Hornet is the Navy's primary strike and air superiority aircraft. It's an updated version of the original Hornet, the McDonnell Douglas FA-18 Hornet. So what makes this new Hornet iteration super? The short answer is enhancements in size, range, and capabilities. But if you're looking for more details, let's look at some numbers. The Super Hornet features a roughly 20% larger airframe than the original Hornet. This airframe is also 7,000 pounds heavier when empty and can carry 15,000 pounds more than the FA-18 Hornet. The same applies to the internal fuel department, as the Super Hornet can carry 33% more internal fuel. The result? This highly advanced aircraft has a 41% longer mission range and 50% higher endurance. Talk about impressive! Of course, the significantly larger weight means that the catapult and arresting system must be set differently. Interestingly, the Super Hornet was supposed to be even heavier by as many as 400 pounds. However, Boeing managed to keep its weight lower while still meeting all the necessary performance requirements. Speaking of performance, the Super Hornet can perform virtually any mission in the tactical spectrum. In this video, you've already heard how it performs in two of these mission types, night strikes with precision-guided weapons and the suppression of enemy air defenses. However, the combat-proven Super Hornet can also be sent on a number of missions like day strikes with precision-guided weapons, fighter escort, close and deep air support, maritime strike, forward air control, tanker missions, reconnaissance, and others. Impressive, right? Well, we're just getting started. During these missions, the Super Hornet can also be armed with a wide range of munitions, in addition to the Paveway laser-guided bombs and AGM-88 harms we mentioned. In the intense strikes in Yemen, the Super Hornet showcased its versatility and power. It wasn't just equipped with the standard loadout, this fighter jet was armed for a diverse range of threats. For taking down Houthi drones, it carried the agile AIM-9 Sidewinder short-range air-to-air missiles, and to counter enemy ship missiles, it deployed the AIM-120 AMRAAM, capable of beyond visual range strikes. But the Super Hornet's arsenal doesn't end there. It's a true multi-role fighter, armed to the teeth with an array of weapons for any scenario. Its M61A1, A2 Gatling gun systems offer rapid-fire precision. The AIM-9X Sidewinder and AIM-7 Sparrow missiles bring a triple threat capability and medium-range radar homing, respectively. It's equipped with Harpoon missiles for all-weather anti-ship warfare and slams and slammers for standoff land attacks. The Maverick guided missiles, joint standoff weapons, and joint direct attack munition kits further expand its capacity for precision and power. This extensive and varied armament truly puts the multi in multi-role fighter, making the Super Hornet a formidable force in any combat scenario. However, the Super Hornet is not just a formidable combat aircraft. Its versatility extends to playing a crucial logistical role in the skies. With its Advanced Aerial Refueling System ARS, the Super Hornet seamlessly transitions into a tactical airborne tanker. This adaptability is a game-changer for the Navy, especially considering the vacuum left by the retirement of the KA-6D Intruder and Lockheed S-3B Viking tanker aircraft. But just how does the Super Hornet fare in this newfound role? When it comes to fuel capacity, it's on par with the revered KA-60 Intruder, this comparison not only highlights the Super Hornet's multifaceted capabilities, but also prompts us to delve deeper. Here's another fun fact you may not have known about. The Super Hornet's ARS includes an external 330-gallon tank with a hose reel and four additional 480-gallon tanks for a total of 29,000 pounds of fuel on the aircraft. Besides an impressive fuel capacity, the Super Hornet boasts the ability to return to the aircraft carrier with a larger load of unspent fuel than the original Hornet. But as impressive as the Super Hornet is, this aircraft wasn't the only equipment used during the February 3rd strikes. 
According to some reports, the Tomahawk land attack missiles TLAMs, were likely used to target UAV storage and operation sites, as well as helicopters parked outside. This brings us back to the why question from the beginning of the video. Why did the US and the UK strike terrorist-controlled Yemen with such ferocity? Well, these strikes were a direct response to a barrage of Houthi attacks into the Red Sea, which the CENTCOM labelled as one-way UAVs. Of course, the Super Hornets were also used to shoot down these drones, all deployed from the USS Dwight D. Eisenhower aircraft carrier. But here's another why question for you. Why is protecting the Red Sea of such high importance? Perhaps President Joe Biden can chime in with an answer to this question, as he called this sea one of the world's most vital waterways. And that's precisely what the Red Sea is. This crucial maritime choke point connects the Mediterranean Sea to the Arabian Sea, and in turn, the Indian Ocean. With the Suez Canal, this sea provides one of the fastest and shortest ways to travel between Asia and Europe. With this in mind, it shouldn't be surprising that as much as 15% of the global trade passes through the Bab al-Mandab Strait at the southern end of the Red Sea and, in turn, the 120-mile-long Suez Canal. In 2023 alone, roughly 21,344 ships have taken this route, which comes out to about 58 vessels per day. Though the Houthis haven't primarily targeted these vessels, global shipping companies have mostly decided to reroute their vessels either way, thus avoiding the potential conflict zones and ensuring the safety and the security of their assets. Of course, these moves are bound to have disastrous global economic repercussions. After all, rerouting means that ships must go around Africa through the Cape of Good Hope, which is significantly longer, costlier, and less efficient. To understand just how less efficient this route is, all you need to know is that it adds between 3,000 and 6,000 nautical miles to the ship's journey. So let's say a ship is traveling from Shanghai, China, the world's largest container port, to Rotterdam, the Netherlands, Europe's largest container port. Typically, this voyage would cover about 10,600 nautical miles and last roughly 27 days. However, when rerouted, the ship must travel at least 13,800 miles, which adds a minimum of seven days of transit. If there are multiple ports of call, this figure can increase to 10 to 14 days. Still, the way the companies see it, it's better to arrive at your destination later than not at all. That's why it shouldn't be surprising that the expected freight container volumes through the Red Sea region fell by as much as 78% in January 2024. But what do the Houthis gain from such a massive disruption to global trade? Or in other words, why did they even start wreaking havoc on the Red Sea region? To understand the answer to this question, you must first learn who the Houthis truly are. If you ask the US Department of State, the answer is simple. They're a specially designated global terrorist group. But if you look at the Houthi movement from their perspective, they see themselves as a political and religious faction seeking representation and autonomy for their community, the Zaidi Shia Muslim minority in Yemen. Of course, this still doesn't explain their actions in the Red Sea, but bear with us, it will all make sense soon. You see, the Houthis, or Ansar Allah, as they're officially known, are part of the Iranian-led Axis of Resistance. Beside the Houthis, the informal political and military coalition includes the Syrian government, Hezbollah, a Lebanese political party and militant group, and various Palestinian militant groups, including Hamas. Most of these groups are designated as terrorist organizations by the US, with Syria designated as a state sponsor of terrorism since 1979. Unsurprisingly, the US is exactly who this coalition sees as the enemy, together with other powerful Western nations. The same goes for the Arab countries of the Persian Gulf and Israel. Now that both Israel and Palestine are in the picture, you might see where we're going with this one. Yes, the Houthi attacks in the Red Sea started shortly after Hamas's October 7th attacks on Israel, which claimed around 1,200 lives. When Israel invaded the Gaza Strip in response to these deadly attacks, the Houthis vowed their support to Palestinians and started attacking commercial vessels they claimed were bound for Israel. The US responded by forming a multinational coalition called Operation Prosperity Guardian in December 2023, consisting of 10 known and 10 anonymously involved nations. This coalition was designated to protect commercial shipping in the Red Sea. Soon after, in February 2024, the European Union also launched a naval mission, Operation Aspides, to protect the cargo ships in the Red Sea. So far, Germany, France, Italy and Belgium are planned to contribute ships to this mission headed to the Red Sea and the Gulf of Aden. But as important as Operation Prosperity Guardian is, not all US attacks have been part of this military operation. 
In fact, the primary strikes we're discussing today, the ones led by the Super Hornets, were conducted outside Operation Prosperity Guardian. Though the Red Sea attacks are a central part of the Red Sea crisis, this crisis is also a part of the broader proxy war between the US and Iran. After all, Iran is who presumably arms the Houthis, enabling them to target ships and cause chaos in the Red Sea. Though Iran denies these claims, it's abundantly clear that the Houthis couldn't operate at such a high level without the arms, training, and intelligence of one of the strongest armed forces in the world. That's how the Red Sea crisis has been able to become a tit-for-tat military standoff between the Iran-backed Houthi movement and the US and its allies. On their own, the Houthis would never be powerful enough to stand up to, let alone provoke, the most powerful military power in the world. With this in mind, let's go through the most significant developments in the Red Sea crisis before and after the Super Hornets got involved. In early November, the Dwight D. Eisenhower Carrier Strike Group, IKECSG, arrived in the Middle East amid rising regional tensions. This is also when intense Houthi attacks were taking place on the vessels in the Red Sea began. On November 19th, the Houthis landed a helicopter on the Galaxy Leader, a Bahama-flagged and British-owned carrier traveling from Turkey to India. They seized the vessel and rerouted it to the Hodeida port in Yemen. As of February 2024, the entire crew aboard this ship, 25 seafarers, is still held captive. Since the seizure of the Galaxy Leader, at least 40 ships have been attacked by the Houthis, primarily in the Southern Red Sea. The Bab el Mandeb Strait seems to be their location of choice, as they often attack vessels as soon as they enter the strait. Given the strait's relatively small dimensions, roughly 20 miles wide and 70 miles long, and strategic importance, it should be clear why it's been chosen as the primary location of the Houthi attacks. However, the Houthis didn't stop at attacking the ships. They also launched numerous ballistic missiles at Israeli military posts. Most of the initial Houthi threats were identified and neutralized by the Israeli Defense Forces IDF. The first notable time the US IKE CSG got involved was on December 6th, when the USS Mason shot down a drone launched from Yemen. Throughout December, the US forces continued downing a barrage of drones and missiles sent over the Southern Red Sea. Toward the end of this month, the F-18 Super Hornets had their first notable engagement in the Red Sea. Launched from the USS Laboon on December 26, these fighter aircraft destroyed 12 one-way attack drones, two land attack cruise missiles, and three anti-ship ballistic missiles fired from Houthi-controlled Yemen. This is roughly the same time that Operation Prosperity Guardian was established. However, the situation didn't get any better after December 2023. In fact, the conflict only intensified in January 2024. On January 10th, the Houthis launched a large-scale attack against some of the IKE CSG vessels, as well as the USS Laboon and HMS Diamond, with at least 21 UAVs and missiles involved. The US responded on January 12th, bombing dozens of Houthi-linked targets in Yemen, together with the UK and other allies. It also marked the first time Houthi targets in Yemen were bombed since the beginning of the Red Sea crisis. This time, the Tomahawk missiles were used to strike 28 locations within Houthi-controlled Yemen, killing five Houthi fighters and injuring six. Like the February attacks we discussed at the beginning of this video, these locations primarily included command and control centers, munitions depots, production facilities, launching systems, and air defense radar systems. All in all, over 100 precision-guided munitions of various types were used to strike these locations. Besides US Tomahawk missiles, the UK Eurofighter Typhoon multi-role combat planes had a notable role in these strikes. Four Typhoons left the Akrotiri Air Base in Cyprus just hours before the strikes, carrying a payload of 500-pound laser-guided paveway bombs. These joint US and UK strikes continued throughout January. Most notably, 14 missiles across Houthi-controlled areas in Yemen were destroyed on January 17th while a January 22nd attack took care of eight Houthi targets in the vicinity of Sana'a airfield. As for maritime combat, most Houthi missiles were shot down before they could cause any damage. However, a January 30th missile got close enough to the USS Gravely that the destroyer had to employ its close-in weapon system, CIWS, to down it. It's also the first time a CIWS was used in the Red Sea theater. This brings us to February, one step closer to the third day of the month when the US unleashed the Super Hornets on the Houthis. But what preceded this day? On February 1st, the Houthis fired several anti-ship ballistic missiles on the merchant vessels in the Red Sea. 
Luckily, all of these missiles hit the water before causing any damage. The very next day, the Houthis launched nearly a dozen UAVs, all shot down by USS Kearney and USS Laboon. Super Hornets, armed with the Sidewinder short-range missiles, likely took part in these counter-operations. Having had enough, the US and UK launched the February 3rd attack on dozens of Houthi locations, undoubtedly the largest scale operation in the Red Sea crisis. The Houthi spokesman, Mohammed al bukaiti responded to these strikes by declaring that the group would meet escalation with escalation. Houthi media also listed the names of 17 fighters killed during these strikes following public funerals in Yemen's capital Sana'a. However, despite the Houthi threats, most of the devastating attacks following the February 3rd strikes were launched against them, not by them. For instance, on February 24th, the US and UK conducted another joint airstrike, hitting 18 targets across eight locations in the Houthi-controlled zones of Yemen. Again, these targets were underground weapons storage facilities, radars, helicopters, and UAV systems. With the inclusion of underground locations, you can already guess which equipment made another appearance. That's right, the Super Hornets. As for the British forces, the British Ministry of Defence said that four Typhoon fighter jets supported by two Voyager tankers participated in these strikes. According to the Houthi official news agency, these strikes reportedly killed a civilian and injured eight more. If true, this would mark the first civilian casualties of the joint US and UK airstrikes against Houthi-controlled Yemen. However, in spite of the heavy losses the Houthis have suffered, they don't seem to be backing down. So let's answer two more questions pertaining to the future of the Red Sea crisis. One, why aren't the significantly less powerful Houthis retreating? And two, how big of a threat are they really? Let's start with the second question. The Houthis boast an estimated 20,000 fighters and a range of fearsome ballistic missiles and drones. As explained, most of their military equipment is either supplied by Iran or at least based on the country's design. Before the Red Sea crisis, the Houthis successfully deployed these weapons against Saudi and Emirati military and infrastructure targets. The most notable weapons among them are the Shahab-3 medium-range ballistic missile, with a range of over 800 miles, the Ghadar medium-range ballistic missile, an improved Shahab-3 variant with a range of up to 1,200 miles, and several anti-ship ballistic missile models with ranges up to and above 500 miles. If you crunch these numbers, you'll see that most of Saudi Arabia, the United Arab Emirates, Qatar, Iraq, and Israel are within range of these missiles. This includes several U.S. strategic facilities such as the al Udaid Air Base in Qatar, Camp Arifjan in Kuwait, and the Naval Support Activity Naval Base in Bahrain. But even so, what makes the Houthis a massive threat isn't their military capabilities, it's their mindset. This also answers any questions about their persistence in the Red Sea crisis. You see, the Houthis have been in a state of war for over 20 years, and as far as they're concerned, this state can go on forever. As Hussam, a 24-year-old from Sana'a, told The Telegraph, the Yemeni people are prepared to take a beating for the sake of their homeland, pride and honor. That's why it shouldn't be surprising that the US and UK strikes seemingly embolden the Houthis rather than scaring them or compelling them to stop. The way they see it, they can't lose face both domestically and internationally, the only option is to continue. For this reason, it's highly unlikely that the US will resolve the Houthi conflict through a purely military solution. Even if the country's armed forces were to invade the Houthi-controlled parts of Yemen, they would hardly accomplish anything. Why? Well, for one, there's no central command to attack and force to surrender. By their very nature, the Houthis are a decentralized group that operates in a highly adaptive manner. This mode of operation would also allow them to hide in mountains or tunnels until the threat passes, making it nearly impossible for a conventional military force to achieve a decisive victory. The same goes even if the US only sticks to targeting the Houthi military equipment. The drone systems supplied by Iran are cheap and easy to transport, so the Houthis can constantly replenish their supplies. It would take the US and its allies a lot of time and money to continue taking out each and every one of these systems. Worst of all, even though the Houthis are often seen as nothing more than an Iranian proxy, the truth is that the group is pretty self-sufficient. And while Iran and its regional allies want to avoid a major conflict with the US and its allies, the Houthis' intentions are less clear. As Bilal E. Saab, the director of the Defense and Security Program at the Middle East Institute MEI, in Washington, D.C., puts it, it's going to be really hard to tame them. It's going to be really hard to rein them in. But what do you think? 
Do you believe the US resolve might fade over time, especially considering how much the country is needed in other theaters? Or do you think the Houthis represent too big of a threat for the US to back off? And if strikes in Houthi-controlled parts of Yemen continue, how big of a role do you see the Super Hornets having? Share your thoughts, opinions, and theories in the comments section below. Israel's Iron Dome defense has literally been the difference between life and death in their war against Hamas. However, an even more advanced defensive network is waiting in the wings. While the Iron Dome has demonstrated its effectiveness on numerous occasions, that heralded system might take a back seat to the high-tech power that is the Iron Beam. Also known as Light Shield, the Iron Beam is a laser-based air defense network that can obliterate short-range rockets, mortar bombs, and artillery. Not only that, but it can also fend off unmanned aerial vehicles (UAVs), a tactic Hamas has been relying on more than ever. And the price of each laser fired is negligible. According to many estimates, it only costs Israel $2,000 per shot to utilize this technology. Given the potency and economical design of this emerging warfare wonder, it's easy to see why many consider it superior to the iconic Iron Dome. Some go so far as to say that it will completely replace the Iron Dome. But can the Iron Beam deliver on its promise? To answer this, we need to compare the technologies side by side. Let's start with the older of the two, the Iron Dome. Released in 2011, the Iron Dome has been a staple of Israel's defense tactic for more than a decade now. It's a sophisticated system of detectors and rocket launchers that intercept enemy missiles. The technology is made up of three elements. The first element is the radar. When a hostile launches a missile at Israel, up to 43 miles away, the Iron Dome identifies it and gathers data on the projectile's trajectory. The second element is a computer. The computer receives the information from the radar and calculates where the missile is going. Figuring out the destination of a ballistic missile is relatively easy since it's fairly predictable. That's because ballistic rockets generally fly on an arc. If you can identify the arc, you'll get a pretty accurate idea of where the missile is supposed to strike. That's exactly what the Iron Dome computer does. The third element is the launcher. If the computer determines that the missile will hit a strategic or populated area, it sends Tamir interceptors to collide with the projectile mid-air. If the missile can't be intercepted, the Iron Dome allows it to reach the designated location to save interceptors for future use. The ability of the Iron Dome to protect civilians and military strongholds is being put to the test as we speak. Ever since the beginning of the most recent assault by Hamas, they have launched thousands of rockets that targeted heavily populated areas. Thanks to the Iron Dome, the vast majority of them failed to reach their destination. But this isn't the first time the Iron Dome demonstrated the might of the Israel Defense Forces IDF. It's protected the nation from projectiles throughout the 21st century. However, that's just scratching the surface of the Iron Dome's influence, history, and technological prowess. It might tell us if the Iron Beam is an addition to their arsenal or a full-blown replacement. The first instance of the Iron Dome being used in combat can be tracked down to March 2012. It was at this time that Gaza terrorists launched a major missile offensive on southern Israel, discharging approximately 200 projectiles in under three days. Hamas operatives thought they had caught the IDF off guard, but the Iron Dome proved them wrong. The system calculated that most of the rockets were headed toward unpopulated areas, which would result in no casualties. However, the Iron Dome intercepted more than 50 rockets that targeted Ashkelon, Ashdod, and Beersheba. If not for the Iron Dome intervention, there's no telling how many innocent lives would have been lost. It didn't take long for the Iron Dome to react once again. In November of the same year, Hamas launched another airstrike that included over 1,500 projectiles aimed at Israel. The Iron Dome intercepted about 400 of them. The vast majority of the remaining rockets were deemed harmless. The defense was executed hand-in-hand -hand with the IDF's Operation Pillar of Defense which aimed to lower the number of missiles Hamas could use to besiege Israel. Two years later, the Iron Dome was under immense pressure yet again. This time, it was Tel Aviv and Jaffa that the system had to safeguard against Hamas rockets. At the start of Operation Protective Edge, Hamas targeted numerous densely populated regions of both Tel Aviv and Jaffa. Fortunately for the Israelis, the missiles proved no match for the Iron Dome, which intercepted around 700 rockets. The defense paved the way for a resounding IDF victory, resulting in 32 Hamas tunnels destroyed and hundreds of terrorists vanquished. 
The history of Iron Dome intervention doesn't end there. In May 2019, the Palestinian Islamic Jihad PIJ, and Hamas teamed up to send nearly 700 projectiles toward Israel. Most ended up in open areas, resulting in no casualties. However, the Iron Dome also saved the lives of countless civilians by bringing down 240 missiles. The longer the conflict between Israel and Palestine goes on, the greater the intensity of Hamas's rocket attacks. This was on full display in 2021, when Hamas and the PIJ aimed to strike a decisive blow to the IDF by firing 4,350 projectiles at Israel. The number would be overwhelming for practically any other defense system, but not for the Iron Dome. Even though the intensity and number of missiles had been unprecedented, the Iron Dome didn't disappoint. It intercepted nearly 1,500 incoming projectiles that were headed toward populated and strategic military areas. The pressure from Hamas mounted when terrorists started launching missiles from various directions, but the Iron Dome proved to be an insurmountable obstacle. Over the course of this defense operation, the Dome had a 90% success rate. However, this didn't discourage Hamas from launching additional assaults. The IDF knew it would need to upgrade its defense system even further and position the Iron Dome on multiple fronts. And so it did. In 2022, Israel announced that Sea Dome, the ship-mounted version of the Iron Dome, would soon enter the marine battlefield. The system passed several tests that showcased its ability to repel different threats that could emerge from the sea. In June of 2023, the IDF conducted another series of tests that proved Sea Dome's effectiveness at intercepting drones, cruise missiles, and rockets. Israel has already developed several Sea Domes on its SAR 6-class corvettes, small warships, to protect the country's shipping lanes, coastline, and natural gas rigs. By blocking the foe's projectiles from destroying their targets, Sea Dome should help ensure Israel's maritime superiority in the Mediterranean Sea and the Red Sea. Over the years, the Iron Dome has received numerous expensive updates to keep the forces of Hamas at bay. Israel's leading defense technology company Rafael Advanced Defense Systems invested billions to develop and keep the system efficient. The US also pitched in with approximately $3 billion allocated for interceptors, launchers, general maintenance, and many other aspects of keeping the Iron Dome in great shape. More financial aid from the US is in the offing. Specifically, President Biden recently announced that America would provide additional military assistance to support the Iron Dome. He's not the only one behind this initiative. Several members of the US Congress proposed a bill that would send Israel another $2 billion to reinforce the Iron Dome. With all this funding going to the Iron Dome, one can't help but wonder, what if there was a better, cheaper way for Israel to defend itself? This brings us to the other side of today's debate, the Iron Beam. If you think that laser weapons from Star Wars are improbable, the Iron Beam will prove you wrong. The system fires laser beams to topple airborne targets. Like the Iron Dome, it features a surveillance network that detects enemy projectiles before engaging them. As soon as the Iron Beam identifies a threat, it sends a laser that travels at the speed of light and reaches the missile before it reaches its destination. The IDF and Raphael didn't randomly decide to pursue such technology. The development started as a result of increasingly dangerous assaults by Hamas, who diversified their arsenal. They recently relied on UAVs and mini-UAVs, besides rockets and mortars, to threaten the Israeli military and general population. The Iron Dome proved instrumental in vanquishing these dangers, but it's also expensive. Each interceptor fired costs between $40,000 and $50,000. This might not sound like much if the Iron Dome fires just two or three missiles, but that's not the threat it faces in the war against Hamas. As previously noted, Hamas often engages Israel with multiple projectiles from different locations. Fired in quick succession, they force the Iron Dome to release hundreds or even thousands of interceptors at the same time. Not even the most powerful militaries can afford such costs in the long term. Rescue comes in the form of the Iron Beam. Using this system, the IDF can shoot down Hamas missiles for a fraction of the price of the Iron Dome. Each laser costs the Israeli military only about $2,000, including the price of technology development, allowing them to launch 20 to 25 lasers at the cost of one Iron Dome interceptor. If that's not a viable and affordable long-term defense strategy, we don't know what is. Another reason the IDF may replace the Iron Dome with the Iron Beam is to improve the efficacy of its defense tactics. The Iron Dome is highly effective, with a consistent 90% success rate across different operations. The extra 10% might not sound much, 
but even a single missile that bypasses the interceptors can wreak havoc on Israel and result in lives lost. The main reason the Iron Dome isn't 100% effective is that it's designed for small strikes. If Hamas launches thousands of rockets in a short window, the Iron Dome doesn't have the capacity to prevent each projectile from hitting its target. The Iron Beam, on the other hand, might just be the ace up the sleeve the IDF has been looking for. This technology features a power output of approximately 100 kilowatts. This gives the Iron Beam enough velocity to reach the rocket before it makes contact with the target. Since the technology is so fast, it can pick apart numerous projectiles in just a few seconds. What about the magazine requirements of the Iron Beam? This is yet another aspect where the Iron Beam excels. Given the laser-based design of the technology, there's no need to reload the weaponry. The fiber laser generator constantly fuels the Iron Beam meaning it can never run out of ammunition, as long as the generator is operational, of course. The same cannot be said for the Iron Dome. Although advanced, it still features a traditional magazine design that requires consistent manual reloading. Hamas troops can seize that break in activity to bomb defenseless cities. This won't happen on Iron Beam's watch. What's also impressive about the Iron Beam is that it reduces the debris caused by intercepting enemy missiles. Traditional rocket defense systems tend to result in lots of debris. And it's easy to see why. Just picture two rockets slamming into each other at dizzying speeds. The energy released during the process is almost unfathomable, so imagine what this energy does to the two missiles. It scatters them into thousands of pieces, all of which turn into mini projectiles. They can't harm buildings and other structures, but rogue shrapnel can prove lethal to civilians trying to hide from the commotion. The Iron Beam is a real game-changer in this respect. Rather than sending up a rocket to collide with another missile, it ejects a mighty laser beam that virtually obliterates the opponent's projectile. This lowers the debris caused by the blast and makes the area underneath the explosion a lot safer. The Iron Beam sure sounds formidable, but is it safe to use? No weapon is 100% safe, but the Iron Beam is much safer than some of its traditional rocket defense counterparts. By now, you already know the weapon uses laser technology. However, it doesn't use just any laser. The Iron Beam runs on so-called solid-state lasers which focus beams using lasing mediums. This lasing medium is a type of solid crystalline substance that's much safer to operate than liquid or gas weapons. Because the IDF doesn't have to use hazardous chemicals to operate the iron beam, solid-state lasers have always been safer than gas and liquid solutions, but up until recently, they weren't strong enough for military applications. The spearheads of solid-state laser technology came up with several breakthroughs in the 21st century to address this concern. Nowadays, these lasers can consistently engage and deal with targets, which is exactly what the Iron Beam does. Given all the incredible features of the Iron Beam, one might say that it will undoubtedly replace the Iron Dome. Still, the technology isn't perfect. You need to consider the downsides of the Iron Beam to figure out whether it'll take Iron Dome's position. The first of which is the relatively low power design of this defense mechanism. Yes, you heard that correctly, the Iron Beam isn't as powerful as some other man-made weapons. For instance, you can now find 300 kilowatt weapons that can annihilate even the most robust rockets or knock them off course. But the industry has even more powerful weapons. There are also 1,000 kilowatt lasers that can easily engage hypersonic or ballistic missiles, allowing militaries to use them to devise the most effective defense strategy. In fact, these projectiles are so powerful that they can burn through the fuselage. Don't get us wrong, the IDF's iron beam is potent but it can't compete with the destructive power of big guns. For this reason, it's not appropriate for all defense duties, such as taking down large drones and missiles. It's more suitable for standard mortars and rockets. Now, you might be thinking, the Iron Beam is a laser weapon. Don't lasers evaporate anything they hit, regardless of their power? Lasers destroy their targets through heat transfer. The heat of a laser passes onto the object, making it burn. The speed at which the target burns depends on the laser's strength. In this case, the Iron Beam's 100 kilowatts aren't enough to vaporize massive targets. In 2020, various tests proved this by observing how long it took for certain weapons to wipe out small airborne drones. The testing featured a slightly stronger weapon, 150 kilowatts, than the Iron Beam. Even so, it took the weapon about 15 seconds to vanquish the target. Since the Iron Beam isn't as powerful, it would take even longer to obliterate large drones and missiles giving some projectiles plenty of time to reach the ground and potentially cause massive damage. Next, you need to consider atmospheric scattering, which is essential when discussing any laser weapon, not just the Iron Beam. 
Atmospheric scattering refers to the disturbance created by sand, water vapor, salt, air pollution, smoke, and many other impurities, all of which make the laser less effective at long ranges. So far, the iron beam hasn't overcome this hurdle. It can destroy targets up to 4.3 miles away, anything longer than that, and the iron beam will likely fail to disable the projectile before it hits its target. That's not to say the iron beam and other lasers can't be used at longer ranges. For instance, the IDF can utilize the technology beyond 4.3 miles to dazzle, blind, or otherwise distract the optical sensor of a satellite, weapon, or airplane. Once this happens, the target of the laser may no longer be able to receive data that guides it to its intended destination, rendering it virtually useless. But if total destruction of a rocket or mortar is the only mission, 4.3 miles remains the threshold beyond which the iron beam cannot achieve success consistently. Another drawback of the iron beam is that it's susceptible to thermal blooming. If the weapon fires in the same direction for a few hours, or even minutes, it raises the temperature of the surrounding air. Ultimately, the heat can cause the laser to defocus and make it vulnerable to hostile projectiles. Now, thermal blooming isn't a major factor if the iron beam engages its target at a particular angle, but when there's a heat-resistant missile that's headed straight at iron beam, the lack of focus puts the weapon at a greater disadvantage reaching its destination. The good news for IDF is that mortars and rockets used by Hamas don't have extraordinary heat resilience, but this doesn't make the iron beam immune to more advanced rockets. Thermal blooming, atmospheric scattering, and some other shortcomings elevate the need for impeccable beam control. The laser also needs to have a clear line of sight with the target to be effective. This brings us to yet another flaw of the iron beam. It's hard to use. Many more years of testing are required to polish the technology and make it more user-friendly. The IDF, Raphael, and other spearheads will also need to work around the weapon's limited effectiveness at long ranges. Therefore, it's safe to say that the Iron Beam won't replace the Iron Dome, at least for now. Israel has accelerated the development and research behind the technology due to the ongoing conflict with Hamas, but even the most optimistic forecasts say the Iron Beam won't be deployed before 2024 or 2025. Although the Israelis have expedited the development of the Iron Beam, it's only natural to think that, considering the urgency of the ongoing crisis, they would have already approved it for warfare use. That hasn't been the case for several reasons. The primary challenge is technological. More specifically, the developers struggled for many years to generate a 100-kilowatt beam that could quickly destroy its targets. They saw that it was hard to concentrate this much power into a single beam and maintain its velocity. But they came up with a brilliant solution to divide the laser into multiple beams. This ensured enough power and speed, giving them the best of both worlds. However, splitting the beam into several smaller beams is no easy feat. The scientists had to fine-tune the timing of each beam, so it would work in unison with the other beams and heat enemy targets rapidly. Only recently did the IDF overcome this obstacle. Another and perhaps even more important reason is regional instability. Since 2019, there's been constant unrest in the Israel-Palestine relations. To make matters worse, Israel has had many short-term governments that prioritized different policies. All this was reflected in the military budget. The state simply didn't have enough money to speed up the iron beam production further, which is why they postponed the development. While you may have seen videos of the iron beam in action, none of them actually show the laser weapon. Some display the iron dome batteries intercepting inbound rockets that make the camera lens flare, which appears like a laser on screen, while others use edited footage from warfare video games. Whatever the source of those clips, one thing's for sure, as of today, the Iron Beam isn't being used to defend Israel from Hamas missiles. When it finally makes its appearance, it won't replace the legendary Iron Dome. Instead, it's designed to be employed side by side with the existing technology. How exactly will the two technologies work to destroy rockets, missiles, UAVs, and other aerial threats? The answer is pretty straightforward. You need to consider the design and intended purposes of the Iron Dome and the Iron Beam. Once the two systems operate side by side on the battlefield, the Iron Beam will primarily deal with short-range projectiles, including standard rockets and mortar bombs. It should also be heavily used for intercepting UAVs and drones. That's because these aircraft have light shells, which are typically made of heat-sensitive materials such as plastics. The minimal heat resistance makes them sitting ducks for the laser beams since the beams can cut through them like a knife through butter. Basically, the iron beam can vaporize these targets in milliseconds. 
Another factor that will determine the roles of the iron beam and the iron dome is the distance. Since the iron beam is only effective at ranges up to 4.3 miles, it won't be used to intercept distant rockets, missiles, drones, and UAVs. Likewise, it's less effective in cloudy weather, because this makes it harder to maintain accuracy. The same goes for mist, haze, and other atmospheric elements, which can compromise the system drastically. With short-range, lightweight targets eliminated courtesy of the iron beam, the potential of Israel's enemy to inflict massive damage is drastically reduced. Nevertheless, long-range, heavy-duty missiles remain. That's where the Iron Dome comes in. As it's designed to destroy projectiles up to 43 miles away, it's much more effective than the Iron Beam at long ranges. The moment it identifies a rocket within its radius, the weapon intercepts it with a missile of its own, vanquishing it before it gets dangerously close to the ground. The short-range, long-range dynamics is where the power of the Iron Dome and Iron Beam is most evident. If the hostile launches thousands of rockets in quick succession, the Iron Dome can intercept about 90% of them, but some are bound to bypass the system. The Iron Beam supports the Iron Dome by vanquishing any projectiles that enter its 4.3-mile radius, which increases the overall efficiency of Israel's missile defense network. So, the Iron Dome will need to bear the brunt of assaults due to its effectiveness at longer ranges, but the quality of the projectiles is also important. Whenever an Iron Dome interceptor reaches the foe's rocket, it destroys it instantly. Unlike with the Iron Beam, this process doesn't span several seconds. Even if a missile has a thick metal housing, it's no match for the Iron Dome. The Iron Dome-Iron Beam duo should get things done most of the time. However, Israel wouldn't be one of the top five militaries in the world if it had just two systems in its missile defense strategy. The two weapons are mighty, but they won't retire other networks in the IDF's arsenal. Consider the Arrow 3, jointly developed by the Israel Missile Defense Organization and the United States Missile Defense Agency, Arrow 3 is part of the Cutting Edge Arrow Weapon System AWS, the first ever anti-tactical ballistic missile ATBM, defense network. Arrow 3 detects, monitors, intercepts, and obliterates enemy TBMs with a variety of rockets over a massive surface, enabling the system to protect many population centers and strategic assets using hit-to-kill technology. It launches a missile that contains a kinetic kill vehicle vertically, and whenever necessary, it changes the trajectory of the projectile toward the calculated interception point. Only upon identifying and getting close enough to a hostile warhead does Arrow 3 launch the kill vehicle. The range of the system is nearly 1,500 miles, and it can intercept weapons at heights of up to 60 miles. Another essential part of Israel's defense system is the colorfully named David's Sling. This weapon is also designed to intercept projectiles fired by Hamas or other enemy countries, including Syria and Iran. The range of David's Sling is approximately 160 miles, which is longer than the Iron Beam and the Iron Dome, but shorter than the Arrow 3. This makes the system ultra-effective at toppling mid-range projectiles, enabling it to reduce the pressure on the Iron Dome and the Iron Beam by annihilating rockets before they enter the radiuses of the two systems. And it might be best to end the debate on this note. The goal of the IDF when developing new defense systems isn't to replace a weapon that's already proven its effectiveness. The goal is to support the existing arsenal and create a virtually impregnable layer that not even the most intense rocket assaults can breach. That being the case, the Iron Beam will not replace the Iron Dome anytime soon. It'll mainly intercept short-range projectiles, UAVs, and drones if they make it past the Iron Dome. But at the end of the day, who knows what the future holds? Hamas may make Israel overhaul its defense strategy. If that happens, what do you think the roles of the Iron Dome and the Iron Beam will look like? Will the two weapons complement each other? Or will the IDF need to develop an even more advanced solution to destroy hostile rockets? Let us know in the comments and don't forget to subscribe for more military analysis from military experts. Well, it's safe to say that 2023 did not end well for a small contingent of Houthi rebels operating in the Red Sea. According to representatives from US Central Command, on the morning of December 31st, four small vessels being operated by members of the Iranian-backed militant group were decimated by a group of US Navy Seahawk helicopters that had responded to the urgent distress call of a Singapore-flagged civilian shipping vessel. Armed with crew-served and small-arms weapons, the Houthis approached and began firing at the 353-meter-long container ship, the Maersk Hangzhou. 
During the attack, the four small boats got dangerously close to the much larger vessel, within 20 meters, and even attempted to board it. And when it looked like the Maersk Hangzhou's onboard security team might be outmatched, the call went out to the Navy. But this wasn't the first time that Maersk Hangzhou called the Navy for help. In fact, it was the second time in less than 24 hours that they'd been attacked by Houthi forces, as they were traversing the increasingly dangerous waters of the Southern Red Sea. Just the day before, the ship was reportedly hit by a Houthi-fired anti-ship ballistic missile, and after the incident was reported to the Navy, the USS Gravely, an Arleigh Burke-class guided missile destroyer deployed to the region earlier in the year, would end up shooting down two other missiles intended for the Maersk Hangzhou. Perhaps realizing they weren't going to get lucky with a long shot, the Houthis decided to move in for a closer attack, but this strategy would ultimately not work out well for them. Once that second call came in, around 6.30 a.m. local time, a small formation of Navy Seahawks lifted off from the deck of the USS Dwight D. Eisenhower, one of the Navy's 11 nuclear-powered aircraft carriers. Arriving on target a short while later, the Seahawks issued a series of verbal warnings to the Houthis, who responded by opening fire on the hovering helicopters. Big mistake. In an effort to defend themselves, the helicopters swiftly sank three of the four Houthi small boats, while the remaining boat fled the area. Once the smoke cleared, so to speak, there was no reported damage to either US personnel or equipment, nor were there any casualties among the crew of the Maersk Hangzhou. The Houthis, on the other hand, lost 10 fighters in the confrontation, according to a Houthi military spokesman who also strongly warned against any further escalation by their American enemy. To annihilate the attacking Houthis, the Seahawk gun crews likely relied upon a combination of their two primary weapon systems, the versatile and reliable 7.62mm M240 machine gun, which can be mounted in a side door or window, or the 50 caliber GAU-21, also known as the M3M. These are both formidable weapons that can provide essential offensive and defensive capabilities. The tried and tested M240 has been renowned for its accuracy and sustained firepower since the late 1970s, and its versatility allowed the Seahawks crew to engage their targets with deadly precision. But in situations where increased firepower and penetration might be needed, the M3M is going to be your best bet. Whether it's used for suppressive fire or precision targeting, this heavy weapon delivers devastating firepower, making it ideal for engaging armored targets or larger threats encountered in a maritime environment. Like a handful of powerboats loaded down with rebel fighters packing AK-47s. The Navy Seahawk helicopter, formerly known as the Sikorsky MH-60 Seahawk, is a versatile and highly capable aircraft, truly the modern-day workhorse of the Navy's current arsenal of aircrafts. The Seahawk was adapted from the Army's UH-60 Black Hawk and the Sikorsky S-70 family of helicopters, but ended up with a few highly unique design features, including foldable main rotor blades and a hinged tail. These modifications were specifically included with naval operations in mind, so that the Seahawk could be used for a wide range of maritime-related missions, including anti-submarine warfare, anti-surface warfare, search and rescue, and various forms of naval logistic support. Two of the most notable variants of the Seahawk are the SH-60B and the MH-60R. Similar in design and capabilities, both the SH-60B and the MH-60R are currently being used by the Navy for a variety of combat, surveillance, and support missions. The MH-60R, though, is the more widely used and more modern variant, entering into service in the early 2000s, compared to the SH-60B, which was introduced in the 1980s. The MH-60R comes equipped with advanced sensors, including an airborne low-frequency sonar system, air-launched sonobuoys, and a sophisticated APS-124 search radar system. This allows it to detect, track, and engage submarines and surface vessels with precision-guided weapons such as Hellfire missiles and Mark 54 torpedoes. Another variant, the MH-60S, is primarily used for logistic support, personnel transport, and search and rescue, or SAR, operations. It features a large cabin space capable of accommodating cargo, passengers, or medevac patients. The MH-60S can also be equipped with machine guns and other defensive systems so that it can carry out these missions in a hostile environment. In fact, all Seahawk variants come with a variety of defensive capabilities designed to enhance survivability in combat situations, including infrared countermeasures, chaff, and flare dispensers to counter incoming missiles, and armor-plated seats to protect the crew against small arms fire. But their primary defense is their ability to operate and engage potential threats at a distance, as we saw during this recent skirmish with the Houthis. 
The typical crew for a Seahawk consists of a pilot, an airborne tactical officer or ATO, and a sensor operator. In most cases, the ATO or sensor operator is responsible for employing the helicopter's weapon systems, including its machine guns and missiles. They will typically coordinate with the pilot to engage targets effectively, but in certain situations, the pilot may also retain the ability to pull the trigger. And in terms of power, the Seahawk's airframe is propelled by two 1900 SHP T700 GE 401C turboshaft engines. Manufactured by General Electric, these engines are renowned for their reliability, performance, and efficiency, making them well-suited for the Navy's demanding operational tempo. The impressive power output and advanced technology of the T-700 enables the Seahawk to reach a maximum speed of 233 km per hour, 145 miles per hour, at an altitude of 1,500 meters, 5,000 feet. Operating with standard fuel reserves, the MH-60R typically has a range of 245 nautical miles, approximately 454 kilometers, while the SH-60B has an average range closer to 450 nautical miles, approximately 833 kilometers. What makes these aircraft truly combat effective, however, is their capability to deploy at a moment's notice not just from shore bases or forward operating locations, but from Navy aircraft carriers, destroyers, frigates, fast combat support ships, expeditionary transfer docks, and amphibious assault ships. They can take off from and return to essentially any vessel with a flat deck, which allows for an impressively diverse mission profile. Combined with their imposing level of firepower, it was the Seahawks' rapid deployment ability that's made them so effective against the mounting Houthi threat. According to CENTCOM officials, the Houthis have launched nearly 40 attacks on the international shipping industry since November 19, 2023. But since the recent string of attacks in the Red Sea began, this was the first time a US asset had actually killed any Houthi combatants. Since Hamas attacked Israel last October and Israel promptly invaded the Gaza Strip, the Houthis have continued to use anti-ship missiles and drones to attack vessels they believe are either linked to Israel or heading to Israeli ports. And as a consequence, a number of shipping companies have diverted their vessels around this area of the Red Sea, which has resulted in daunting delays and other global supply chain issues. For example, just two days after the Houthis' disastrous face-off with the Seahawks, the Danish shipping and logistics company Maersk, the operator of the Maersk Hangzhou, announced a 48-hour pause in its Red Sea and Gulf of Aden operations. But it's not only the shipping companies who are responding to the Houthi threat. Back in December, in response to increased hostility from the Houthis and rising fears within the commercial shipping sector, the US Department of Defense launched Operation Prosperity Guardian, a security initiative that would bring together maritime forces from the United Kingdom, Bahrain, Canada, France, Italy, Netherlands, Norway, Seychelles, and Spain in an attempt to address the navigation and security challenges in the Red Sea and Gulf of Aden. According to U.S. Defense Secretary Lloyd Austin, the new initiative's forces will operate under the umbrella of a previously established multinational naval partnership called the Combined Maritime Forces. They will also fall under the leadership of Task Force 153, a U.S. Navy-led initiative that's based in Bahrain and is focused on maritime security in the Red Sea. Austin first introduced Operation Prosperity Guardian during a visit to Bahrain where he stopped during a broader trip to the Middle East that also included meetings with leaders in Kuwait, Qatar, and Israel. During those meetings, he emphasized the importance of safeguarding freedom of navigation in international waterways. Given that approximately 10 to 15 percent of worldwide shipping passes through the Red Sea, the problem with the Houthis has resulted in billions of dollars in losses for commercial shipping companies. And since the introduction of the initiative, there's been notable progress. So far, over 20 nations have committed to participate, and more are expected to join the coalition in the future. Individual contributions to the collective effort are expected to range from military assets such as ships and aircraft, to troops, to advisory personnel, to other forms of military, financial, and logistical support. However, the commitment from allies hasn't been as reliable as the US was hoping for. Almost half of the nations who joined up have chosen to remain unnamed, while some named partners have opted to contribute only a minimal amount of personnel. The DoD remains optimistic that the coalition will grow over time. At first glance, though, the group seems to be lacking the participation of several key players, including Turkey, Germany, Egypt, South Korea, and Japan. Other nations, including Italy, India, and France, prefer to stay out from under the US initiative's umbrella and are sending ships to the region on their own. But while these individual deployments may, in the long run, contribute to Prosperity Guardian's success, 
They also send the message that even some of America's closest allies remain hesitant to publicly align themselves, which isn't fully unexpected given the long-burning firestorm of controversy surrounding the West's participation in Middle East affairs. Even though the overall goal of Prosperity Guardian is to boost the confidence of commercial shipping companies so that they'll feel safe returning to business as usual, the unenthusiastic response from some of the US's most powerful allies does raise some concerns for the folks in Washington. At its inception, policymakers in DC had hoped this new operation would have similar success to international counter-piracy efforts in Somalia, but that hasn't been the case, probably because there are some clear differences in the Houthi threat perhaps the most notable being the highly political nature behind the Houthis' motivation. The Houthis have made it perfectly clear that Israel's invasion of Gaza and the West's increased meddling is their primary driver for these attacks. And as the Biden administration continues to offer its support to Tel Aviv, many nations remain very hesitant to appear as though they're taking a definitive side in the conflict. This is particularly true of the Middle Eastern and North African states that have previously expressed support for Palestine, as well as European countries with a mostly pro-Palestinian voting population. A realistic long-term strategy is also a concern for Washington. Many are already asking, how long can the US maintain an impactful presence in the region? And if the US were to leave, wouldn't that just open the opportunity for future Houthi attacks? With new crises emerging regularly, the US resources are getting stretched further and further, which means that without a reliable, long-term international partnership, the US cannot guarantee freedom of navigation and safe transit along the Gulf of Aden and Red Sea. A recent estimate by US officials claimed that over 2,000 ships have been forced to change course to avoid the Houthi threat plaguing the Red Sea. In the past, the Houthis have used anti-ship cruise missiles, anti-ship ballistic missiles, explosive surface drones, and aerial drones to intimidate or attack both civilian and military vessels. But recently, they've decided to try out another approach, an underwater attack. According to a recent report from CENTCOM, the Navy carried out a series of self-defense strikes in Houthi-controlled waters around Yemen against what they described as an unmanned underwater vessel, or UUV as well as another uncrewed surface vessel, USV, and three mobile anti-ship cruise missiles. This marked the first instance of US forces encountering an underwater threat since the escalation of the Houthi attacks began. Just a few days before the UUV incident, CENTCOM issued a press release regarding the US Coast Guard's capture of an Iranian weapons shipment intended for Houthi forces in Yemen. CENTCOM hadn't yet released specific details about the Houthi UUV destroyed by the Navy, but the photographs taken by the Coast Guard showed a propeller or screw section that's consistent with UUVs used by Iran, revealing a clear point of connection between Iran and the newly emerging Houthi UUV threat. Iran has a long tradition of unconventional naval warfare, one that's continued to evolve and now includes unmanned boats, aerial drones, and underwater drones. The UUVs commonly used by Iran are similar to a torpedo or one-way attack underwater drone OWA AUV. These generally have a greater range than a torpedo, but are slower, which makes them more effective against static targets such as ships in port or at anchor. The UUVs typically used by Iran can also be fitted with a short mast, so it can be observed as it makes its way toward its intended target. It's also possible that Iran's UUVs can be remotely operated by a wire similar to wire-guided torpedoes, which would allow them to engage a moving target. Iran is believed to have used similar devices against tankers off the coast of the United Arab Emirates. Hamas, too, has attempted to use similar vehicles against Israel's offshore energy infrastructure. The Houthis' newfound interest in the use of UUVs could become a huge problem for the Navy and its allies, for underwater weapons are inherently harder to detect and counter than surface vessels. A UUV is more likely to remain undetected until it actually impacts its target, and because the point of impact is typically below the waterline, there's a significantly increased risk of the vessel being sunk. A warship hoping to counter an underwater attack must also rely on a very different set of tactics. One technique is using an explosive-laden surface drone, or USV, like the ones Ukrainian forces have been using against similar Russian threats. So far, though, the Navy has been highly successful in thwarting both the Houthis' surface and underwater attacks, but there's no telling how they will adapt or what other capabilities Iran might supply them with. For this will likely not be the last shipment of Iranian weapons that gets intercepted on its way to the Houthis. Nor was it the first. Since April 2015, in fact, the US military has intercepted at least five other shipments. 
Among other weapons and munitions, these shipments included thousands of AK-47s, anti-tank missiles, and even a few sniper rifles. But how do we know they came from Iran? By analyzing the recorded GPS data for each of the vessels, and from information gathered from interrogating the crews, the Navy was able to determine the ships originated from Iran, likely the Bandar Abbas port, located on the southern coast along the Persian Gulf. This news didn't come as a surprise to officials from Saudi Arabia, who have long insisted that the Houthis were being supported by Iran. The intercepted shipments did, however, add credibility to those claims. But that didn't deter the Iranian foreign ministry from insisting that these claims were completely false. Along with the Coast Guard, the USS Gravely has also been staying busy, recently shooting down another anti-ship cruise missile launched from Houthi-controlled territory in Yemen. This attempted attack followed one that targeted the USS Kani, another Navy destroyer patrolling near the Gulf of Aden. In both cases, the ships destroyed the Houthi missiles fired at them, and they were able to avoid any damage or injuries to the crew. The Houthis have been eager to take responsibility for these recent attacks, in some cases perhaps too eager. According to US defense officials, the Houthis have even gone so far as to take credit for attacks that never happened. For example, they recently claimed to have targeted a Navy expeditionary mobile base, the USS Louis B. Puller, located in the Gulf of Aden, but the Navy says there was no such attack. Alongside Hamas and Hezbollah, the Houthis have declared themselves to be part of the Iranian-led so-called Axis of Resistance, or the unofficial League of Extremist Groups who have aligned themselves against Israel, the US, and the West more generally. According to experts, though, the Houthis' true motivations and political ideologies remain somewhat vague and contradictory. Originally, Houthi insurgents set out to imitate Hezbollah. They wanted to have power over the region without actually ruling. But the Houthis have always been on the outside, a militia group that's now only started to dabble in politics. And as a result, their Hezbollah-like denunciation of both the US and Israel often appears to be mostly for show. Despite their jihadist rhetoric, it's possible that they're simply another extremist faction looking to capitalize on the spoils of corruption. Originally known as the Ansar Allah, or Partisans of God, the Houthis later adopted the name of the movement's late founder, Hussein Badreddin al-Houthi. Emerging in northern Yemen in the 1990s, largely as a reaction to the rising Saudi influence in the region, the Houthis are a Shia Muslim political religious faction that, at the moment, controls a large portion of northern Yemen, including much of the Red Sea coastline, where they run a de facto government that collects taxes and prints its own money. Since 2004, they have been actively fighting against Yemen's Sunni majority government, and it's no coincidence that around this same time, Yemeni President Ali Abdullah Salah began calling for the arrest of hundreds of Houthis and even offered a reward for the capture of the group's founder. Tensions exploded a few months later when the older al-Houthi was killed and his younger brother, Abdul Malik al-Houthi, stepped up to take command. Sporadic clashes between the Houthis and government forces continued for the next few years, leaving hundreds dead on both sides until a brief ceasefire was agreed upon in March 2006. Salah even granted amnesty to some 600 previously captured Houthi fighters, but by early 2007, they again found themselves at war. The fighting would continue for another five months until they could reach yet another ceasefire agreement. Things remained relatively cool for nearly a year until the fighting erupted again, and after a few months, around July 2008, Salah would be forced to relinquish the Houthi-dominated Sadar governorate to the rebels. Just over a year later, however, the Yemeni military would strike back with force, launching Operation Scorched Earth, with the intention of stamping out the Houthi rebellion in Sada. Around this time, the Houthis crossed over the border into Saudi Arabia and began engaging with Saudi forces in a series of cross-border clashes as well. The Saudis responded by launching airstrikes against the rebels and engaging in regular ground skirmishes. Negotiations between Saleh and the Houthis went back and forth with little progress until February 2010, when Saleh's government agreed again to a ceasefire. But this may have been intended more as a form of misdirection, because early in 2010, the Yemeni military also launched Operation Blow to the Head, a crackdown on both Houthi forces and combatants from Al-Qaeda in the Arabian Peninsula, or the AQAP. But the tide really began to turn in the Houthis' favor in the wake of the Arab Spring, after Salah was ultimately ousted from the presidency. By the fall of 2014, the Houthis had taken control of most of Sana'a, Yemen's capital, and the Red Sea port of Hodaida. And by early 2015, the Houthis had taken control of the Yemeni government, a move that was swiftly denounced by the United Nations. Salah's successor, President Abdrabu Mansour Hadi, conceded to the Houthi leadership and was placed on house arrest, 
but soon fled the presidential palace in Sana'a, narrowly escaping to Aden. But once out of harm's way, he rescinded his resignation and declared himself the legitimate president of Yemen. He also declared the Houthi takeover a blatant coup d'etat. In 2016, the Houthis would dominate most of northern Yemen. By 2018, they were getting increasingly bold in their choice of targets, with missile attacks on Saudi Arabia becoming increasingly common and, not to mention, a July 2018 attack that damaged a Saudi oil tanker. Also in mid-2018, Yemen's now-exiled president met with United Arab Emirates Crown Prince Mohammed bin Zayed al Nayyan, and together they launched an offensive to reclaim the port city of Hodeida that was ultimately unsuccessful. Savage fighting and horrendous human rights violations have torn the country apart, creating what the United Nations has called the world's worst humanitarian crisis. More than 23 million people, 80% of Yemen's population, would end up desperately needing humanitarian aid and protection. And as conditions worsened and the violence continued to escalate, US support for the Saudi-led coalition in Yemen began to waver. Several former Obama administration officials signed an open letter expressing regret for their support of the war and encouraging both sides to lay down their arms. Then, in December 2018, the US Senate passed a resolution invoking the War Powers Resolution, effectively bringing an end to US military support for the Saudi-led coalition that had been conducting airstrikes and other military operations in Yemen since 2015. The resolution to halt all logistical support and arms sales to the coalition passed the Senate with bipartisan support, making it the first time in history the Senate had voted to invoke the War Powers Resolution. Just a few months later, in February 2019, former Secretary of Defense James Mattis' resignation took effect, bringing an end to the Trump administration's commitment to finding peace in Yemen. In April, despite bipartisan support in Congress, President Donald Trump would veto the War Powers Resolution, arguing that it was both dangerous and an attempt to weaken his constitutional authority. Soon, the Trump administration would also put a freeze on $73 million of humanitarian aid for Yemen, a decision that drew heavy criticism from humanitarian organizations and lawmakers who argued that cutting aid would only worsen a situation that was already terrible. And after the US took a big step back, it didn't take long for the UAE to follow, announcing in July 2019 that it had completed its troop drawdown in Yemen. Recognizing an opportunity to advance their own interests, however, another Yemeni political military organization known as the Southern Transitional Council, or STC, moved quickly to assume control of the highly important cities in the south, including Aden, Abiyan, and Shabwa. Since its inception in 2017, the STC has strongly advocated for the secession of southern Yemen and its restoration as an independent state, as it was before South Yemen and North Yemen were unified in 1990. Prior to the merger, North and South Yemen existed as two separate entities, and when they were joined, the intention was to create a single, sovereign state known as the Republic of Yemen, with Aden as its capital. But conflicts between the two regions, fueled by political, economic, and social differences, immediately broke out, eventually erupting into a civil war in 1994 when the South rallied and tried to secede. And when the STC made its move around the end of August, the UAE jumped back into the mix this time launching a series of air raids against Yemeni government forces who were en route to Aden, hoping to take control back from the STC. But wait, you're probably thinking, wasn't the UAE just fighting with the government against the Houthis to reclaim Hodeida? They were, but it appears the UAE lost faith in President Hadi and Yemen's weakened central government. The dynamics and power struggles within Yemen are highly complex. But for the most part, they are based on the desire for control and national security amidst a series of violent conflicts. The UAE's support for the STC has probably been rooted in a combination of strategic, security, and geopolitical goals, with the overall aim of advancing its interests in Yemen and the broader Middle East region. And in terms of the Houthis, it's probably safe to say that the UAE thinks the STC will do a better job of countering that threat. Despite the drawdown of foreign troops and continually shifting alliances, the Houthis continue their campaign, launching Operation Victory from God against Saudi-led forces in the region. They also escalated their attacks on Saudi oil installations, including the use of drones to bomb oil processing facilities in Abqaiq and Qurayis in eastern Saudi Arabia. As a result of these attacks, Saudi Arabia loses nearly half of its oil output capacity. But while the Houthis are happy to take credit for the aggression, the international community blames Iran, because they're the ones who must have provided the technical expertise needed to carry out such attacks. At the start of 2021, the Trump administration designated the Houthis a foreign terrorist organization, FTO, 
but as soon as President Biden took over, he revoked the FTO designation. Biden also officially put a stop to Washington's support of the Saudi-led coalition's offensive operations in Yemen, but he would continue to support the UN-led peace process, and also offered his assurances to Saudi Arabia regarding the defense of its territory. The fighting continues, with regular Houthi missiles and drone attacks against Saudi oil facilities, airports, and air bases. While the Saudis retaliate with airstrikes of their own, the US continues to condemn Houthi actions but opts to remove its most advanced missile defense systems from Saudi Arabia. Then the UN announces that nearly 20 million people, or two-thirds of Yemen's population, are dependent on humanitarian aid for daily needs, five million of whom are on the brink of death due to famine or related disease. But due to dwindling international funding, the World Food Program cuts food aid to Yemen, which leads to a dramatic increase in the cost of food. But as bad as things are now, the situation in Yemen was incredibly dire long before the Houthis stepped up to support Hamas at the start of Israel's invasion of Gaza. Almost immediately after the war started, the Houthis began attacking Israel with missiles and drone strikes, but the majority of these were intercepted. As we've seen, the Houthis have mostly been making an impact out on the Red Sea, as they've increasingly targeted ships which are Israeli-owned, flagged, or operated, or are heading to Israeli ports. Shortly after these first attacks, the UN Security Council issued a stern warning to Houthis on behalf of 44 countries around the world. In this joint statement, the UN demanded the Houthis stop attacking civilian ships and immediately release any detained vessels or crews or else. They did not comply, and despite the ongoing efforts of the Navy, as well as many other nations' militaries, this did not seem to be enough to deter the increasingly bold, almost daily attacks occurring in the Red Sea. Yemeni officials continue to insist that Iran, as well as its proxy Hezbollah, have provided arms, training, and financial support to the Houthis. But both Iranian and Hezbollah officials have denied or downplayed these claims. And so the back and forth continues, with Iran claiming their support of the Houthis is solely political, while the US continues to accuse Tehran of enabling them to terrorize civilian operations in the Red Sea. In a recent analysis conducted by the US Defense Intelligence Agency, for example, it was confirmed that the Houthi forces had been using Iranian-made missiles and UAVs in their attacks. As far back as 2014, the analysis revealed Iran's Quds Force, a branch of its Islamic Revolutionary Guard Corps that specializes in unconventional warfare and military intelligence, had been providing the Houthis with an arsenal of sophisticated weapons and training. With Iran's support, the so-called Three H's, Hamas, Hezbollah, and the Houthis, have been able to create a serious amount of chaos, and there's genuine concern among the international community that a full-scale war might break out between some combination of the US, Yemen, Iran, and Israel. If Iran were to directly attack Israel or some American asset in retaliation to the Navy's continued attacks on the Houthis, or if the US were to ramp up their support of the Yemeni government, that might just be enough to spark the next major conflict in the Middle East. So far, the isolated attacks and skirmishes we've seen haven't been enough to warrant direct military action from Iran, and Iran's leaders have been taking a more pragmatic approach. Even if they don't approve of Israel's invasion of Gaza, it seems they'd rather avoid a war that would likely involve the US, a war they would likely not win. Even before the arrival of the Houthis, from the Persian Gulf to the Red Sea to the Mediterranean, tensions in this region had been smoldering for decades. The conflict between Palestine and Israel is one of the world's longest-running disputes. But it wasn't until the emergence of Hamas, as well as the other two H's, that the stage will be set for nearly 15 years of violent conflicts on the scale we're seeing today. Ever since the first major conflict erupted between Israel and Hamas in 2008, the Gaza Strip has experienced ongoing destruction and horrendous civilian casualties. But on October 7th, a whole new chapter of this war opened up. Many experts believe Hamas's sudden escalation of violence was intended to derail the potential peace agreement that was being brokered by the US between Saudi Arabia and Israel. As part of this agreement, Saudi Arabia intended to address Palestine's concerns in general, but the Palestinians were not directly involved in the discussions, and this did not sit well with Hamas or their supporters. After Hamas's highly coordinated and brutal attack on the State of Israel, which included various other Palestinian militant groups, including the Palestinian Islamic Jihad, or PIJ, October 7, 2023 would be called the deadliest days for Jews since the Holocaust. Around 1,400 people were killed, including IDF soldiers, families that were attacked in their homes, and attendees of an outdoor music festival. Most of the casualties were Israeli civilians, but a number of foreign nationals were also murdered in the attack, 
while an estimated 240 others were hauled back to the Gaza Strip as hostages. The next day, Israel officially declared itself to be at war with Hamas, prompting Prime Minister Netanyahu to warn Gazan residents that they'd better get out as soon as possible. Another day later, Israel began a full-on siege of the Gaza Strip, cutting off much of the region's supply of water, electricity, food, and fuel. Given the horrendous conditions and mounting casualties in Gaza, it's clear why Hamas is going to fight this one out to the bitter end. But why, you might be asking, are the Houthis risking their hard-won gains in Yemen by getting involved in a conflict that one, doesn't directly involve them, and two, is thousands of kilometers away? Simply put, it's political. As members of the Axis of Resistance, the alliance of proxy militant groups that Iran has assembled throughout the region, the Houthis can boost their standing within the alliance by taking an active approach. For the Houthis, this means treating any Israeli-affiliated vessel traveling along the Yemeni coast as fair game for attack. Before returning to Yemen in the early 2000s and becoming more politically active, several members of the Houthi leadership received religious education in Iran. But to label the Houthis' aggression toward Israel and its allies as simply a favor to Iran would be to overlook their own wider geopolitical ambitions. The group's enthusiastic support of Hamas and Palestine more broadly might also gain them both domestic and regional support for their efforts to control Yemen. But what do you think? Can the Houthis advance their own cause by aligning themselves with Hamas and Iran? As the Israel-Hamas war continues, will they become a more serious threat in the Red Sea? Even with Iran's support, will the Houthi threat ever be a match for the US Navy assets like the MH60 Seahawk? Let us know in the comments. On October 7, 2023, the Hamas terror group, which controls the Gaza Strip, executed its most ambitious operation against Israel. In an unprecedented move that came on the 50th anniversary of the Yom Kippur War, Hamas militants actually invaded Israel territory, taking the otherwise intelligence-savvy Israelis completely by surprise. Thousands of people from Israel and many other countries were killed, wounded, or taken prisoner by the terrorists. Crucial to the success of their attack was a barrage of thousands of rockets that flew into Israeli territory at the time the border incursions were happening. The barrage consisted of up to 5,000 rockets in a few minutes and was the biggest challenge yet to Israel's vaunted Iron Dome missile defense system. But what is Iron Dome? How does it compare to other missile defense systems like the United States Patriot and NASAMS? And how did Hamas actually begin to breach the Iron Dome when it has previously proven incapable of doing so? Let's begin. Since its foundation in 1948, Israel has faced repeated attacks from its enemies in the region who have denied its right to exist as a state. These attacks have ranged from the small-scale assaults of lone wolf terrorists to all-out wars with neighboring countries. Throughout the years, Israel has frequently been subjected to rocket attacks from Hezbollah, Hamas, and other terror groups in the area. In the 1990s, a series of rocket strikes across the Lebanese border from Hezbollah convinced the Israelis that they would need to create a homegrown missile defense system. The Israelis' war with Hezbollah in 2006 further convinced them of this need. Despite skepticism from the United States that it could work, the system was developed by an Israeli company called Rafael Advanced Defense Systems, with American assistance to the tune of $200 million. It came online in 2011. Since then, Iron Dome, which is a mobile system mounted to specialized vehicles, has been an integral part of Israel's air defense network. A naval version designed to protect Israeli ships made its debut in 2017. So far, there are no foreign users of Iron Dome, though the system is in demand abroad. According to its maker, Raphael, two Iron Dome systems were delivered to the US Army in 2020. Ukraine also desires to use the Iron Dome as a short-range air defense battery against Russian missiles and Iranian Shahed drones, which have wreaked havoc on Ukrainian cities and civilian infrastructure since the invasion of February 2022. Israel has so far not granted this request, however. Iron Dome works by a precision radar system. Its radar detects rockets in the air, determines their trajectory and speed, and automatically calculates whether they will pose a threat to Israeli population centers. If they do not pose a threat, the rockets will not be intercepted, which makes sense since it saves ammunition. If the rockets do pose a threat, however, Iron Dome will fire two missiles into the incoming projectile's path to blow it up in the sky. These missiles have a length of 3 meters and a mass of 90 kilograms. The Israelis originally advertised Iron Dome as being effective against projectiles that have ranges between 4 and 70 kilometers. Although this range has allegedly expanded, 
Israel has 10 Iron Dome batteries spread throughout the country, with each battery capable of defending 155 square kilometers of territory. These batteries are strategically posted around Israeli towns and cities. Each Iron Dome launcher comes with a magazine of 20 Tamir interceptor missiles, and a typical battery includes three to four launchers. The Israelis claim that the Iron Dome is 90% effective, an assessment the US Department of Defense agrees with. For example, in the 2014 Israeli-Gaza conflict, nine Iron Dome batteries intercepted 735 out of 800 rockets that posed a threat to Israeli population centers, backing the claimed effectiveness rate. When fighting broke out again in May 2021, the Iron Dome successfully intercepted every rocket fired by Hamas, which amounted to a barrage of over 470. Near the end of the 2021 iteration of the Israeli-Palestine conflict as a whole, Hamas had fired 4,000 rockets at Israel in total. Some analysis claim that of the 1,500 of them which were on course for Israeli towns and cities, Iron Dome destroyed 1,428. The 2023 rocket attack was much vaster in scale, however, and Israel was unprepared for it. Indeed, Iron Dome has proven so effective that it may have provided the Israelis with a false sense of security that helped to make the attack on October 7th possible. Hamas claims that it launched over 5,000 rockets in only 20 minutes in its initial barrage on October 7th. Israel claims the number was closer to a range between 2,200 to 3,000. Either way, it was the most intense rocket attack ever launched into Israel from the Gaza Strip. Many of the rockets were destroyed and viral videos of Iron Dome in action against the Hamas projectiles spread on social media in the aftermath of the attack. The barrage was large enough and occurred in a short enough period of time to overwhelm the vaunted missile defense system, as many of the Hamas rockets made it through Israel's shield and struck population centers. Some of the penetrating Hamas rockets hit targets as far away as Tel Aviv. This surprised many people who had gotten used to the missile defense system's effectiveness. However, the success of Hamas's attack did not come as a surprise to some experts. Despite its excellent reputation and heretofore high success rate, these experts noticed significant flaws in the system. Because Iron Dome's Tamir interceptor missile has a warhead a third of the way down the projectile's length, as opposed to in its nose, it must approach an incoming rocket from the front, coming at an arc where the two projectiles wind up flying roughly parallel to one another. From here, the missile will detonate and eject a shower of steel rods out of its sides to trigger the warhead inside the enemy rocket and, in turn, destroy the target in mid-flight. This is why Tamir missiles are programmed to approach their target rocket in pairs. It ensures that there is more coverage from the detonation spray pattern. On the other hand, if the Tamir approaches an incoming rocket from its side, nose first, the spray pattern from detonation will completely miss its target. Richard Lloyd, a warhead designer, wrote a classified 28-page report in 2014 claiming that Iron Dome would be completely ineffective if its geometry of engagement was wrong. Further, he claimed that Palestinian rockets were a hard ask for Iron Dome to destroy, because according to him, even if intercepted successfully, their method of construction made them resistant to such neutralization. This is because their warheads are made with thick steel cases and are based on insensitive TNT explosives. Theodore Postol, a missile defense expert and physicist at MIT, with previous experience on the Patriot system, also examined Iron Dome in 2014. Using footage and video of the smoke pattern left by Iron Dome missiles, Postol claimed that 80-90% to of the interceptors did not approach their targets at an effective angle, and as a result, their detonations did not succeed in knocking the enemy rockets out of the sky. The Israelis disputed Lloyd and, in particular, Postol's findings, claiming that the videos the latter analyzed could not be used as an accurate measurement of double or single explosions, i.e. whether Iron Dome's interceptors had successfully destroyed the incoming rocket or not. Iron Dome's heretofore excellent track record in preventing terrorist rockets from impacting Israeli population centers lends one to question Postol's claims. Regardless, Hamas's October 7th attack proved that Iron Dome has its limits. It, like all other missile and air defense systems, can only counter a certain number of enemy projectiles at any given time. If the enemy barrage comes in a sufficiently high quantity, Iron Dome will be overwhelmed. Some military experts believe that if Hezbollah gets involved in the war between Israel and Hamas, the former will be facing even higher intensity barrages with more sophisticated projectiles. Iron Dome's missiles are expensive too, costing between $40,000 and $50,000 per interception. 
This is a relatively modest price tag compared to other missile defense systems out there. However, as Hamas, Hezbollah, and other terror groups have thousands of much cheaper rockets to use, the expenses of Iron Dome still tend to add up. This expense is one reason why Israel is currently developing laser weapons to shoot down enemy projectiles. This will come much cheaper, at a cost of $2 per shot, and laser weapons would be a much more effective way to counter the types of drones that Hamas militants used in its border incursion operation. The laser system will not replace Iron Dome, but rather supplement it, according to the Israelis. With Iron Dome in hot demand, one might ask how it compares to other missile defense systems out there, like NASAMS and Patriot. NASAMS, short for National Advanced Surface-to-Air Missile System, is a joint development between Norway's Kongsberg Defense and Aerospace Company and the United States Raytheon, officially known as RTX Technologies since July 2023. Like Iron Dome, it is a missile defense system. However, it does not have the same mission. NASAMS is specialized to solving a different problem than Iron Dome is. Israel's Iron Dome system is specifically designed to face off against short-range rockets and drones. This makes sense because that is the threat level that Israel is typically subjected to. Hamas, Hezbollah, and other terror groups do not have access to cruise or ballistic missiles, so Iron Dome is specially designed to defend against these short-range threats. NASAMS, on the other hand, was designed to counter state-based threats. Unlike terrorist groups like Hamas and Hezbollah, state actors typically have access to more powerful and longer-range projectiles. So NASAM's mission includes interception of crews and ballistic missiles. In an interview for Newsweek, Thomas Caraco, the director of the Center for Strategic and International Studies Missile Defense Project, compared the two systems. The NASAMS would be a more capable system. It's a little bit more tailored to the cruise missile defense problem, whereas the Iron Dome would be a little bit more on the lower end, still very capable for a different problem set. NASAMS made its debut in 1997. The system comes with an ANMPQ-64 Sentinel radar that can identify targets up to 75 kilometers away in coverage of 360 degrees, although the range would decrease if natural obstructions such as mountains get in the way. The radar is also equipped with counter-electronic warfare capabilities. NASAMS fires more expensive missiles than Israel's Tamir fired from the Iron Dome system. Since the debut of NASAMS-2 in 2000, the system typically contains a battery that includes 12 missile launchers, with each launcher carrying a magazine of six missiles. A fully loaded NASAMS battery can engage 70 targets at the same time. The latest variant, NASAMS-3, has an arsenal that includes surface-launched variants of the venerable AIM-9X Sidewinder for shorter-range threats. The Iris-T infrared homing air-to-air -air missile, effective for medium-range targets up to 25 kilometers away, and the AIM-120 and AIM-120 AMRAAM ER missiles that can hit targets up to 105 kilometers away. The AIM-120 is equipped with a shrapnel array directional warhead that is detonated either by active radar or a fuse upon contact with an enemy projectile. These missiles do not need to fly parallel to their target like Iron Dome's Tamir missiles do, which gives them more room for error. It's not yet known whether NASAMS will be able to work with longer-range missiles in development, such as the 200km AIM-260 JAT-M from Lockheed Martin, which is scheduled to make its debut at the end of 2023. However, it would be more surprising if it would not be able to fire this weapon. NASAMS has a design with open architecture in mind. This makes it adaptable to modern technologies, even though the basis of the system is close to 30 years old. Another example of the system's flexibility occurred in March 2022, when Raytheon successfully tested the high-energy laser weapon system, HULES, in conjunction with NASAMS, showing interoperability between the two. The live fire exercise had the laser get cues from the NASAMS fire distribution center. HULES used the system to track and destroy a series of nine drones at various distances. With these tests, NASAM is rapidly becoming just as much of an anti-drone system as it is a missile defense system, much as the Israelis hope the Iron Dome to become. NASAMS is designed as an intermediate-range missile defense system that can engage targets at low and medium altitudes under any weather conditions. However, it can also integrate itself with systems designed to engage longer range and higher altitude targets, like the Patriot system. The Patriot missile defense system was first designed in the 1970s and made its debut in the early 1980s. Although this makes it a venerable platform, it has been upgraded repeatedly since then. Patriot is short for Phased Array Tracking Radar to Intercept on Target. 
The Patriot is the US Army's primary air and missile defense system, capable of intercepting targets at long ranges and high altitudes. Typical Patriot batteries range from six to eight platforms, with each individual component carrying a magazine of four interceptor missiles. Patriot systems are mounted on M983 trucks, and each launching system carries an onboard 15 kilowatt generator. The Patriot can come with multiple types of radar systems. These are the ANMPQ-53, ANMPQ-65, or an ANMPQ-65A. One of the things that distinguish the Patriot from its missile and air defense peers is that its radar can combine surveillance, tracking, and engagement capacities in one unit. The current version of the Patriot can fire two types of missiles, Pac-2 and Pac-3. The Pac-2 is an evolution of the Patriot system's original Pac-1 missile. The Pac-2 guidance-enhanced missile originated in the 1990s and features better propulsion than its predecessor and a modernized blast fragmentation warhead. Pac-2 uses a track via missile guidance system in its terminal phase. After being command-guided near the target, the Pac-2 passively tracks it as the Patriot's radar system highlights the enemy projectile. When the target is within range, the Pac-2 detonates. The missile has a range of 160 kilometers and a maximum altitude of 25. Pac-2 Patriot batteries use the ANMPQ-53 radar, which is the world's first phased array air defense type of radar. The Pac-3 missile is a vast departure from its predecessors. This missile is smaller, two-thirds lighter, and unlike the Pac-2, it is designed to directly impact an incoming threat, rather than use a blast fragmentation warhead from a close distance. To do this, the Pac-3 must not only be more precise, but more maneuverable. It has an array of 180 solid-fueled altitude control monitors to improve its mobility in flight. Reportedly, the Pac-3 can defend an area seven times greater than the Pac-2. This is partially because of the radar system the Pac-3 relies on. The ANMPQ-65 and its digitized upgrade, the ANMPQ-65A, which has a range increase of 30% over its predecessor. Because the Pac-3 has less room for error than the Pac-2, its radar guidance must be more precise as well. A new radar is also being developed for the Patriot called the Lower Tier Air and Missile Defense System. Surprisingly, the Patriot's current radars do not have 360-degree coverage. LTAMDS will correct this deficiency. It is an active electronically scanned array AESA, radar system featuring gallium nitride GAN, power amplifiers, which is the same kind of technology that will be used for the radars in the United States' coming sixth-generation jet fighters. The Air Force's next-generation Air Dominance NGAD, and the Navy's FAXX. These power amplifiers will offer the Patriot higher jamming resistance, better efficiency, and beam agility. The Patriot system made its debut in 1991 during the Gulf War and was deployed to protect Israel and Saudi Arabia from Iraq's Scud ballistic missiles. The system did not work as well against these missiles as hoped, however, with the Pac-2 interceptors occasionally failing to destroy them. The lessons from the conflict paved the way for the Pac-3's development. The Patriot proved much more effective in the invasion of Iraq the following decade. The Patriot system is also capable of destroying drones, as Israel demonstrated when it used the interceptors to destroy Hamas targets. Syrian drones and an Su-24 plane were shot down in repeated engagements between 2017 and 18 by Israelis using the Patriot system. More recently, the Ukrainians used the Patriot system to destroy a Russian Kinzhal hypersonic ballistic missile that Vladimir Putin once touted as invincible, proving that this air defense system is still capable of matching the most modern weapons. The Patriot might be old, but its upgrades and demonstrated capability show it is still a force to be reckoned with, and its new radar system will make it comparable to some of the world's most modern military programs. As we can see through these comparisons, missile and air defense systems are not one-size-fits-all. Each system will have its own specialized mission. Iron Dome is designed to counter the types of rocket attacks from terror groups that Israel has been plagued with for decades, and this is a job that it does very well. NASAMS is a mid-range, mid-altitude system good for destroying cruise missiles in particular, projectiles that tend to fly in a straight line with constant propulsion and remain at low altitudes on their way to their targets, as opposed to ballistic missiles that fly in much higher arcs. The Patriot system, meanwhile, is excellent for targeting much longer-range threats like ballistic missiles. Missile and air defense systems have improved dramatically over the last century. During World War II, the British were helpless to defend London against repeat German V-2 attacks. 
These early ballistic missiles simply moved too fast and too high into the atmosphere for the existing anti-aircraft systems to be of any use against. Now missile defense systems can shoot down dozens of targets at multiple altitudes at once. With laser technology coming online to assist them at a much cheaper price per shot, these defensive assets are set to become even more powerful in the coming years. However, no matter how good these air defenses become, their success will always be a matter of math. How much ammunition or energy do they have available compared to the incoming enemy weapons? On October 7th in Israel, Hamas used enough cheap rockets to overwhelm the much more expensive Iron Dome. Like all defenses systems before them, modern air defenses are there to raise the costs of an attack, not to stop it. All will eventually fail in the face of an attacker if that attacker has the will and resources to see the operation through. How determined Israel's attackers are in this latest renewal of the Israeli-Palestinian conflict remains to be seen. With Hezbollah allegedly having a rocket and missile stockpile of up to 150,000, with the range to strike all throughout Israeli territory, Iron Dome would be poised to face by far its toughest challenge yet, should the conflict expand. Israel would need to call on other air defense systems like its Patriot batteries and David's sling. But what do you think about these missile defense systems? Have the Israelis relied too much on Iron Dome to the point that they got too complacent about the true extent of Hamas's capabilities? What is the future of air and missile defense in general with hypersonic glide vehicles and drone swarms about to take to the battlefield? Make sure to let us know in the comments. Also be sure to hit the like button and subscribe for more military analysis from military experts. On October 7, 2023, a collection of Palestinian militant groups led by Hamas launched what they called Operation Al-Aqsa Flood, which was nothing less than a full-scale invasion of southern Israel from the Gaza Strip. The date was deliberately chosen, as it was the 50th anniversary of the Yom Kippur War, and it proved the deadliest terror attack in Israeli history. According to an October 9th report in the Times of Israel, which cited a source close to the militants, the attack happened in four stages. First, Hamas fired a barrage of 3,000 rockets into Israeli territory and used drones to take out Israeli surveillance outposts. Second, elite Hamas militants flew across the highly fortified Israeli Gaza border using hang gliders. Third, the militants used explosives to create a breach in the border and bulldozers were quickly brought up to open the gap further. Fourth, another elite unit attacked Israeli command and control jamming communications in the area. The initial infiltration came at six different locations along the 15-kilometer arc on the border. Once this surprise attack had been completed, the rampage in the nearby towns began. As of October 11th, Israel reported over 1,200 fatalities, 3,000 injured and about 150 people abducted in the October 7th attack. That number is still expected to climb. Israelis, meanwhile, have not been the only ones killed or abducted by Hamas. Prisoners include 17 people from Nepal, 18 from Thailand, and 2 from Mexico, according to those countries' foreign ministries. U.S. Secretary of State Antony Blinken said at least 14 Americans were killed in the initial attack. People from countries ranging from France to Cambodia became casualties too. The attack was unprecedented. Not even during the Second Intifada in the early 2000s was there an invasion of Israeli territory. In response, Israel took an unprecedented step of its own and declared war on Hamas. Israel launched airstrikes against Gaza and cut off power and supplies to the territory in preparation for a ground invasion. The fact that such a massive assault, one reportedly up to two years in the making, happened in this way indicates nothing less than a catastrophic intelligence failure on the part of the Israelis. Indeed, reports soon swirled that the Egyptian security services got word that Hamas was planning an attack and tried to warn their Israeli counterparts that something big was coming. However, the warning fell on deaf ears, because these officials were supposedly more worried about Hezbollah to the north and militant activity in the West Bank, which had seen more incidents of violence recently. Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu denied these reports, as did some sources in Egypt. But regardless of whether this particular part of the story is true, at least one critical asset of Israeli intelligence failed – the much-touted and highly controversial Pegasus spyware. What is Pegasus, and how could it have failed to detect this attack? Meanwhile, how did Hamas plan the attack so well that it got around Israel's first-rate surveillance assets and traditional intelligence superiority? 
Let's begin. Israel's intelligence services are regarded as being among the best in the world. They have to be. Since the country's foundation after World War II, it has faced repeated attacks from those who deny its right to exist. The Israelis have had to fend off everything from small-scale terror attacks to full-scale wars with its neighboring countries over the last 75 years. Gaza, the small strip of land between Israel, Egypt, and the Mediterranean Sea, is home to 2.3 million people. It's one of the most densely populated and heavily watched areas in the world. There is also a highly fortified border between it and Israeli territory. Surveillance drones constantly patrol the skies over this tiny piece of real estate. The Israeli intelligence services rely on other sophisticated technological methods of information gathering too. One of those methods is the Pegasus spyware. Pegasus is a creation of a company called the NSO Group, which is a subsidiary of Q Cyber Technologies. The NSO Group was created in 2010 and named after its three founders, Niv Kami, Shalev Julio, and Omri Lavi. Based in Herzliya, Israel, the company is controversial internationally. Reportedly, the NSO Group and its parent helped Saudi Arabia spy on the journalist Jamal Khashoggi, who was murdered by that country's agents on October 2, 2018. A year later, Facebook, now Meta Platforms, sued the company over its illegal spying through its WhatsApp platform. In late 2021, Apple sued the company too, over the use of Pegasus spyware to surveil its iPhone users. American politicians aren't keen on the NSO group either. In November 2021, the Biden administration put it on the United States entity list for acting contrary to the foreign policy and national security interests of the US. This was a big blow to the company, and NSO's placement there deprived it of access to the American technology it depends on. The NSO group has tried and failed to get exemptions from this ban. In July 2023, it began paying three major lobbying firms in Washington to plead its case, claiming that it was doing better background checks on clients and prioritizing human rights. Meanwhile, it criticized its detractors as being one-sided and anti-Israel. So far, these efforts have not amounted to much. Other critics say that the Pegasus spyware has morphed from the anti-terror purposes the NSO group sells it as being effective for. Instead, it has now become a tool for governments to crack down on journalists, activists, and political rivals. In January 2022, reports surfaced which revealed that Israeli police had used Pegasus not to track terrorists, but to spy on citizens and foreign nationals without a warrant or judicial oversight. Even people who were not originally targeted but had the spyware installed on their phones by accident were swept up and the spyware revealed intimate aspects of their personal lives to the Israeli police, and the use of Pegasus spyware in this manner does not stop at Israel's borders. For example, a New York Times investigation revealed that Mexico had become the world's biggest Pegasus user. Mexico was the first foreign client for Pegasus, and successive governments there have used it to target journalists, human rights activists, and other government critics. The use of this spyware became such a big issue there that Mexico's president, Manuel López Obrador, while campaigning in 2018, promised that he would stop Pegasus abuses if elected. However, his promise proved hollow once he assumed power. Mexico's use of Pegasus spyware is even more intense now than it was before his presidency. Another example occurred in Europe in September 2023. Then, the Citizen Lab at the Monk School of Global Affairs at the University of Toronto revealed that Pegasus spyware had infected the iPhone of Galina Timchenko. Timchenko is the co-founder and publisher of the independent Russian Medusa news organization, which is a frequent critic of Vladimir Putin's regime. The incident came two weeks after the Kremlin labeled Medusa as an undesirable organization, although there is still not yet solid evidence that Russia is using the Pegasus spyware. Perhaps another government friendly to Russia was responsible for the incident, or perhaps it was someone else. As of now, we do not know. That would be in line with Pegasus MO as the spyware is designed to obfuscate the source behind its attack. In an effort to placate critics, especially the Biden administration, the Israelis said in late 2021 that they would henceforth prohibit Pegasus sales to governments that had a high risk of human rights abuses. However, Mexico and other governments around the world who have used it intrusively continue to do so. Meanwhile, in early 2022, the FBI also revealed that it had come into possession of Pegasus though the agency claims it has never used the spyware in one of its investigations. But what does Pegasus software actually do? 
The spyware begins by infiltrating a targeted mobile phone. Once inside, essentially all data on the phone is available to the spyware's operators. Call logs, search logs, calendars, passwords, social media activity, photos, emails, browser history, contacts, cameras, and pretty much anything else we haven't listed here are all at the beck and call of Pegasus, and all without the user's knowledge. Pegasus is even capable of recording audio, like a user's phone calls, and getting around encrypted messages by reading them before encryption and after decryption. It can pinpoint a targeted user's location too, and potentially determine the people its targets have been meeting with. Pegasus is smart spyware in other ways too. It hides itself well, and is programmed to self-destruct if it cannot communicate with its command and control center for more than 60 days. It is even programmed to self-destruct if it recognizes that it was installed on the wrong device. Pegasus is not supposed to be mass spyware, rather it's targeted. Being installed on the wrong phone would only give the spyware's operators unnecessary information. However, as we've seen, this is not always the case, and its operators can keep it on the phones of people who have not been deliberately targeted. More recent versions of Pegasus are even harder to find, even for a cybersecurity specialist. In 2021, cybersecurity experts suspected that the spyware now only inhabits a device's temporary memory rather than its hard drive, so when the phone is shut off, it almost vanishes. Meanwhile, even when the phone appears to be turned off, Pegasus can still monitor audio through the device's microphone and video through the camera. The earliest version of Pegasus, which cybersecurity experts discovered in 2016, installed itself by spear phishing. This method consists of tricking people into clicking a malicious link that then puts the spyware on the device. However, Pegasus has gotten far more effective since 2016. It can now install itself through zero-click attacks, which do not require interaction from the phone's owner to be successful. Such attacks are often zero-day attacks, where the malware developer exploits vulnerabilities that an operating system's manufacturer is unaware of. Pegasus exploited WhatsApp through this method. All Pegasus needed to do in the process was make a call from WhatsApp to a targeted device. From there, the spyware installed itself in the device even if the device's owner did not answer the call. This was the origin of the 2009 Facebook lawsuit. Pegasus has another way of infecting devices. It can install itself through a wireless transceiver, which happens to be near a targeted phone. In 2021, some cybersecurity experts discovered unusual network traffic relating to Apple's iPhone photos and music apps at the time of Pegasus infection, which probably means that the NSO group is looking for and has found even more ways to install its Pegasus program on targeted devices. And yet, this sophisticated spyware completely failed to prevent the attack by Hamas on October 7th. This failure by itself is startling enough but what makes it more stunning is that the attack reportedly took up to two years for the terrorists to plan. As we've seen, the execution of the attack on the border was also highly sophisticated. The motion sensors and cameras near the border did not detect any of the militants' movements, which is odd enough. But how could Pegasus fail to detect something that would require such a complicated plan with so many people involved in the conspiracy? The plan was indeed sophisticated. Hamas began its long preparation for the attack by lulling the Israelis into a false sense of security. According to a Times of Israel report, Hamas aimed at giving the Israelis the impression that it was unwilling and unable to fight, all while preparing for the October 7th attack. For example, earlier in the year, Hamas did not get involved in a clash between the Israelis and another terror group in the area, the Palestinian Islamic Jihad. Instead, Hamas was slowly but surely cultivating an image as a governmental body and civic organization of sorts. It spent a large part of its time diverting the Israelis' attention to its pleas for more work permits that would allow Gaza residents to enter Israel, as the jobs there pay significantly more than their counterparts in the Palestinian territories, sometimes up to 10 times the salary. This economic carrot helped create Israel's false sense of security. Speaking to Reuters, an Israeli Defense Force spokesman said the following, we believe that they, Hamas, were coming in to work, and bringing money into Gaza would create a certain level of calm. We were wrong. To ensure it would be sending mixed signals, Hamas continued its typical bombast that called for the destruction of Israel. While in most cases these threats amount to empty boasting or in-group signaling, as a collective, they serve to throw the Israeli security services off their game. Israel seems to have interpreted these calls as customary cries, 
While Hamas's recent actions suggested that they were more interested in improving economic opportunity for Gaza residents. Meanwhile, Hamas launched a deception campaign that included rioting in Gaza to further add to Israelis' distraction. With the riots taking up the Israelis' attention, less attention was paid to the group's plans for its coming terror attack. These were violent incidents, but far less so than the attack that actually happened. When reporting on Israeli surveillance of Gaza, Wired quoted Jack Williams, a former hacker with the United States National Security Agency. Williams said the following, Intelligence in an environment like Israel isn't finding a needle in a haystack, it's finding the needle that will hurt you in a pile of needles. Given the number of Hamas members involved in the invasion, it's not plausible to me that Israel missed every human intelligence reflection of the planning, but I feel confident that there are always Hamas operatives talking about credible plans to attack the IDF. So Israel can't respond with force to every threat, even every credible one. They'd be at a heightened state of alert or actively engaged all the time, and that's probably actually worse for security. Alongside these active deception campaigns, Hamas also took steps to prevent leaks and ensure its internal security. Reportedly, all of the terrorists that trained for the October 7th incident were only there on a need-to-know basis. Many of them were ignorant of the mission they were actually training for. Hamas launched its attack at the right time, too, because the Israeli Defense Force moved more troops to the West Bank to deal with the violence there, as Gaza seemed to be relatively calm. Hamas kept its cards close to the vest with its potential allies, too. The Palestinian Islamic Jihad was invited to participate in the attack only hours before it began. Up until then, it was completely ignorant about Hamas's plans. Most members of Hamas itself were also ignorant. Only a few people within Hamas's elite Qassem brigades were aware of the extent of the planning. Internal Israeli drama helped the terrorists prepare as well. Hamas took advantage of the long-running political controversy in Israel over Prime Minister Netanyahu's attempt to limit the power of the country's Supreme Court to block legislation passed by the Knesset. The country's security services had warned that the political division was eroding their cohesion and readiness. And as all of this happened, Hamas continued training. Reportedly, this training included a mock Israeli border town, where militants stormed homes and killed residents. Israeli intelligence has become quite good at discovering terrorists over the years. It was good enough to know the precise locations of Hamas leadership and has killed the group's important figures in targeted surgical strikes on more than one occasion. Israel was even capable of detecting and neutralizing the underground tunnels that militants from Hamas and other groups used to ferry troops and supplies. With such capabilities, Israel must have seen these structures, but it still allowed itself to believe that Hamas did not want to get into another military confrontation. Hamas has long had Iran's backing, and reportedly, officers from that country's Islamic Revolutionary Guard have been collaborating with the terror group since at least August including multiple meetings in Beirut that included representatives from Hezbollah to help plan the air, land, and sea offensive against Israel. Iran denied these reports, but if meetings occurred between such high officials while Israel was kept in the dark, it raises questions about the effectiveness of Pegasus. It will take a long time before the full details of how Hamas carried out this attack become known, but from what we do know, it's clear that Hamas cashed in on vulnerabilities in Israeli intelligence capability. These vulnerabilities seem to have included the over-reliance on technology. There is one unit in Israel, the 8200 unit, which casts a wide net for developing intelligence sources. The 8200 unit seeks individuals with health problems, potential sex scandals, and so on. However, this human source development may not have been as all-encompassing as experts once believed. In 2005, the Israeli Defense Force withdrew from Gaza which it had militarily occupied since the Six-Day War of 1967. Israeli settlers also withdrew from the area. Since then, Israel has come to rely more and more on technological methods of intelligence collection, in the absence of manpower in the area. For a while, this technological dominance was sufficient for Israel to keep an eye on the area. Many of the targeted assassinations of senior figures in Hamas and other terror groups came during this time. However, and the details are only now emerging, the reliance on this technology seems to have led the Israeli security services to over-specialize in signals intelligence and neglect human source collection. The Times of Israel quoted Amir Avivi, a retired general with the Israeli Defense Force, who once served in an intelligence role as saying, the other side learned to deal with our technological dominance, and they stopped using technology that could expose it. 
they've gone back to the Stone Age. According to Avivi, Hamas militants were no longer using electronic equipment like smartphones and computers to discuss their plans. Rather, they were making plans the old-fashioned way, in person and in secret rooms specifically designed to guard against espionage. Sometimes these rooms were underground. Pegasus may be one of the world's most powerful spyware programs, but it cannot exactly work when the people it's supposed to be spying on don't use electronic equipment to plan their activities. Hamas and its allied terror groups would have known about Pegasus and made plans to get around or deceive it. Once targets understand that they are under surveillance, they tend to find ways to adapt, including alternative means of communication. Did Hamas and other terror groups' knowledge of the Pegasus spyware allow them to deliberately send deceptive signals to Israeli intelligence? Did such a thing affect the A200 unit's ability to develop the sources which could have given it advanced warning of the recent terror attack? It will take some time to figure out. Whatever the final details wind up being, the vaunted Israeli security services suffered a heavy, reputational blow. With the latest outbreak of terroristic violence in Gaza, one which will take them years to recover from. Although the failure of the Pegasus spyware was not the only thing responsible for the catastrophic Israeli intelligence lapse, it was an important component, and the October 7th attack reveals the limits of technology. No matter how highly sophisticated it is, even the most powerful and intrusive surveillance regime will have vulnerabilities that determined attackers will find ways to exploit. But what do you think? Could Israel have made better use of the Pegasus spyware to prevent Hamas's October 7th attack? What other factors could the Israeli security services have neglected? What else went wrong? Don't forget to let us know in the comments section below the video. Also, remember to hit the like button and subscribe for more military analysis from military experts.